as I start um looks like yeah oh what's up surfs people um you know I wish it were a better Monday for me for you guys raiding in I'm I'm sort of in a mood I'm sort of depressed so welcome to a fucked up Monday stream <clears throat> how'd y'all do would y'all get up to either way welcome hi my name's Kai Usually I do like anarchist education, fucking headlines, news analysis, stuff like that. But right now, I'm, you know, dealing with some shit. So, um, I'm just going to let all these f follows and alerts pass on by. Uh, hey, quiet. Yeah, we're here for anarchy, even moody anarchy. Uh, let's see. Did a deep dive on M. Night Shyamalan, Alan, Alan, Alan films. Uh, let me turn the music down. <laughs> Let's turn that frown upside down. Thank you for the gift subs, Deep Dish. Uh, deep Dish Bard. I love a good Bard. Um, bards are always the fun people in the party. Who got them? Herodimus, Lefty, uh, Bike, Six Foot, and DJ Che. All people I know. Rock on. No, himself. I'm not in the mood for D-Gen story time by, by a long shot. Um, by a long shot, I'm not in the mood for D-Gen story time. Um, I'm dealing with some shit, yo. I'm dealing with some stuff. Um, for those of you who don't know, if you're coming from the surfs, I suffer from chronic pain. I've got a progressive neurological condition. Um, and it's progressing. And so I'm sort of dealing with the psychological portion of that recently um yeah um let's see oh um <laughs> there uh 
Let's fry those stupid nerves. I, I, it, Viva, yeah, like the in-betweens, right? It's when they're under attack. After they're dead, well, you know, at least it's just numbness then. Um, hey, Bitawin, uh, Bitawin, I was actually hoping you stopped by. Um, I watched back-to-back uh, -to -back the last two episodes for this season for um, Foundation. Those were a thing. Those were a fucking thing. Um, yeah. Ooh. Um, good on you, Karina. I'm glad you had a decent interview. That's a that's a good thing. Um, yeah, that was uh, quite the the wrap up to the season. Um, I was I was rooting for uh, for uh, Dawn. I gotta tell you, I I was I was um, uh, texture spunky. I am not. Um, I am I am firmly not okay. Yeah, like I'm I'm solidly in the camp of no. But thank you for the well wishes, nonetheless. Um, Viva. Yeah. Well. Fat lot of good that does mean now. Um, hey, Aka. Hey, Buddhist. Um, yeah, a bit of when I was rooting for uh, for uh, for Dawn. I I'm hoping it can too. Uh, you diggeth. <laughs> I was about to compress that down into a, you diggeth. Um, thou dost dig. Um, Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, bit of win. I saw that coming a mile away. When he turned to her, it's like, homie, homie, not your friend, not your friend, not your friend, homie. <laughs> and finally, yeah, um, Harry finally starts showing his true side. Hey, quiet one, thanks for the host. Um, yeah, Harry's finally showing his true true colors, which I, I took him, took him, <laughs> it took him long enough to get there. Loyal to the genetic dynasty. Exactly. I was like, she's, like, she's not your friend, bro. You're not one of, you're not one of them. So that, that's, that's just automatic in her fucking AI brain. Yeah, dude, that was, dude. And then the news, the shadow master. Sorry, y'all. Like Bitwin and I, if any of you were watching uh, the foundation series on Apple, by all means, feel free to join in the conversation between Bitwin and I. Middle one and I are watching it. Um, yeah, I know, right? Like that was an interesting turn. Um, and then the Shadow Master to uh, today. Um, fucking, you're corrupted as well. Oh yeah, they fucking tapped the source. Holy shit, man! <laughs> uh, all the I don't drink textures. Uh, texture Splunky. I I don't drink. I'm sorry. Um, it's terrible for neuropathy. It's terrible for nerve generation and degradation. So I, I literally don't drink. So I have two on my, on my behalf. Um, also have the cast as hot as hell. Uh, oh, um, well, Bitwin, we didn't get a confirmation on Dusk. Dusk was being tested as they spoke. I did not get a confirmation on Dusk as far as I as far as I was paying attention. So, motherfucker could clean house. How? Hey there, cow poker. Um, Aka, it's not the Foundation series by uh, by Asimoth, but that's okay. It's good. Um, they, it's inspired by, right? Like it's 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 it, it's inspired by the Foundation series by Asimoth. They took some ideas and ran with it, which I'm okay with. It's a good series. Um, and yeah, like I didn't, as far as I saw a bit of when we didn't get a confirmation that Dusk was um, Texture Foundation series is fucking good. Um, well, yeah, yeah, the original was corrupted, but Bitwin, we didn't get a time frame. No, 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 you're fine. You're, you, were, you were spot on. They didn't know when. According to the Shadow Master, the original Cleon was genetically corrupted, but they didn't know when it had occurred. And we they were testing Dusk as they spoke. 
scene cut. So we don't know. Um, we don't know when. Oh, Karina, trust me. It's it's superficial at best. <laughs> uh, I feel like I'm listening to people play D and D. It well, I mean, you dig it. Um, the Foundation series is a bunch of books, and it spans thousands of years. Um, it's a very very big series with some very deep lore, and the fact that they're trying to put it as a TV show is well, it's a thing. It's foundational sci-fi. It is. It actually is. Like, the Foundation series is actually foundational science fiction. I mean, it's Isaac Asimov, for fuck's sake. Um, <clears throat> but, um, yeah, we don't we don't know when, um, when it was, when the original Cleon was corrupted. So we don't know if Dusk is, like, did they get in before the last Dusk? Did they get in after the last dusk? He may clean house, right? If he's if they have a clean copy with dusk, then it's good. <laughs> um, otherwise, I'm I'm hoping I'm hoping the entire lineage is corrupted. I'm hoping the entire lineage is corrupted. That would be a good that would be a good plot point for that series. <clears throat> It's better than the movie and wasting even more of said lore. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, he's got uh, the showrunner's got 24, uh, 24 hours to work with. He's got t uh, two seasons of twelve episodes, and then Apple will see if they're going to renew. He's got a show outline for eight seasons to do the foundation story. Um, but as is the first book will be completed by uh, the end of season two. We're halfway through it like i said based on a true story right it's it's f based on the foundation series so saying this is the halfway point at the end of season one is not really entirely accurate it might have to corrupt the whole clean line to bring down the empire in time um uh marcus I mean, I'm not going to lie. Fucking Foundation as a book is kind of dry. Um, like I said, there's a lot of meetings. There's a lot of meetings. I'm not kidding you. Like, if you... If if we... Um, if you go back through the Foundation series and start tabbing pages as to, like, descriptions of meetings, you're going to have a fair amount of tabs, actually. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, but... Honestly, the the Apple TV series has a unique aesthetic. Um, yeah, it's it's dialogue driven in the books. Um, uh, uh, Corey, hey Chris, um, Corey, I'm I'm hesitant, but I'm I'm going to bite that bullet finally. I think um, I I'm going to have to get on some medication. Gabapentin freaks the fuck out of me um, for a couple of reasons. It slows down nervous uh, nervous response, right? So that's great. It slows down the nervous response from, like, pain receptors, right? But it's also affecting up here, right? It, cross it crosses the blood-brain barrier. So it worries me. It freaks me out. It's one of those, like, tri tricyclic antidepressants, um, gabapentin. There's a few things they prescribe for it. Um, I don't think it's the first time the serfs have raided me, actually, Crix. I think it's second or third time. Either way, thank you, serfs. I mean, they, they, the, the show hosts never f stick around for those raid outs. But that's okay. I don't either, and I understand why. Third, Viva. Thank you for tracking, third, uh, Viva. Um, yes, Corey, I've, I've heard that some people, um, uh, Cassidy got a name. <coughs> 100% more than one time. Uh, see? There we go. Um, Rev came in with surfs like eight months ago. Uh, Rex? Yeah. <sighs> I came in because the color scheme was pretty. Um... himself um oh 
Oh, Viva. <laughs> Viva's been watching me. I'm watching you. Um, yeah. But legit, I was, I was, I'm actually um, looking forward to the second season of Foundation. Um, Bitwin and anybody else who's watching. Um, I was super hesitant going into that series. <laughs> I came in because, 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 because. Um, I was super he hesitant going into that series. Um, I like foundation, right? Like you've got, you've got the two camps and there's plenty of overlap, right? The, 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 the Venn diagram for science fiction nerds does have overlap, but you've got the Dune people and then you've got the foundation people. I'm foundation. I, I, I've never gotten into Herbert. I've never gotten into Dune and I'll tell you, I was bored watching the fucking movie too. There were, there were parts that was like, yeah, it's, you know, okay. You know, taken in totality, if I had like all three or four movies that they're going to do for Dune, maybe I could appreciate it more, but I don't, I, it just, something about Dune doesn't click for me. Something about Herbert doesn't click for me. Something about the setting doesn't click for me. Um, I'm a foundation guy. I, I prefer Asimov. I prefer the story. I prefer this. I, I just, yeah. Yeah. Um, they are Bedouin. They're they they are. Um, I mean, second foundation is unto itself, right? Like the first foundation is an interesting story, but the second foundation is where shit snaps. Like it's it it breaks off and starts getting crazy. Um. So you know, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to it and. I, I don't think the viewership is going to be high enough to keep it going. That's my fear. Like, I want all eight seasons. I want all eight seasons. The guy's got a show map. He's got, like, a, a plot ready for the map. Uh, he's got, like, a map ready for the show. Um, I want to see all eight seasons. I want to see what this dude can do. He's doing pretty good. No, I haven't, Marcus. Um... L, not my series, never read the books, um, but it is, it's out there. Um, I mean, God knows Amazon's been trying to shove it down my throat. <laughs> um, I love the Dune books too. I prefer the sci-fi miniseries over the movies, more truthful to the story of the books told in a way that you don't need to have read the books. Interesting. Maybe I'll give that a try sometimes, bit of one. Um... GL, it's not difficult to um, get access to. Even Jon Stewart, when Jon Stewart came back and started doing his Apple show, um, he straight up said, like, at the end of the first episode, he goes, you know, uh, and there's a podcast as well and, like, you know, other stuff on Apple TV+, Plus. but let's be real, you're not watching this on Apple TV+. Plus. None of you know where, how or where to get Apple TV+. Plus. You're watching this wherever you pirated this from. Right? <laughs> I mean, even Jon Stewart fucking owns it at the end of his first episode on Apple TV. Is like, you're not watching this on Apple TV. <laughs> it's just the reality of this situation. So... Credit where credit's due. Um, yeah, I know, GL. I'm not 60 or rich. It comes with, uh, like, I see, I have the, um, I have the, like, Apple One Plus fucking plan or whatever the hell it is that gives me, like, two terabytes of storage and access to, like, all of the stuff, right? Like, all of the Apple services are wrapped into that One Plus and I share it with the rest of my family, right? Like I have, I think it costs me like 29 bucks a month or something like that. And then I just put my uh, my mom and stepdad on my plan, right? So they can have access to like news and fucking music and stuff like that, right? So it works. It's it's cost effective um, for, for, you know, my purposes. Um, mm. um, but you know, gets me full access to like Apple music and plenty of storage. Plus, you know, Apple TV, which by the way, 
was worthless for a while, for a good while. Apple TV was worthless, but credit where credit is due. They're putting out decent content. So, you know, some people really like that C show. Not my, not my gig, but I don't really have any thoughts on late in life, Bakun, and I got little thoughts on late in life, Bookchin. Um, Alec Newman and James McAvoy are easy on the eyes in the sci-fi series. C weird. Um, yeah, I, 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 I couldn't get into that one. Um, oh, Bitowin, did you ever give, um, that invasion series another try? I, I just tapped. I tapped it like episode four. I was like, I'm fucking done. I was fast forwarding through the episodes anyway. Um, <laughs> um, what do you think about Bookchin's conversion from anarchism to communalism? Um, and then sh showing his ML tendencies later, uh, before he died. Um, Bookchin never truly left the ML camp. <laughs> One more episode than you, and then abandoned it. Dude, that series sucked. Like, that just, that series just missed. Um, Bookchin never truly left his ML roots. That's, that's the, the truth of the matter. Um, so... I mean, I'll take, I'll take, um, I'll take a communalistic book chin over a fucking Leninist book chin any day of the week, but he got pretty, um, vanguardistic and authoritarian there towards the end for a minute. Um, maybe Bob, you, maybe the argument could be made that Bob Black um, backed him into a corner and sort of browbeat it out of him uh, because Bookchin and Bob used to sort of get on each other's nerves to a certain extent. Um, but I don't think he, he ever truly left it behind. I don't think he ever... I think in Bookchin's heart of hearts, he was always an ML. Yeah. Hey, Swede. Uh, I, gel. I mean, maybe I'd enjoy it. I didn't see it though. Um. Oh, hang on. Just so while a bunch of people are here, just a friendly reminder. Um, hang on. So you know. Oops, didn't mean to do that. This Thanksgiving, remember the uh, remember the cranberry sauce, but forget the marijuana. Terry was convinced to take a toke of a joint with his friend just to relax. Immediately after, Terry killed his friend who had given him the marijuana in a murderous craze. Not so safe, is it? Marijuana, not even once. Hey, commune. Um. Yeah, just 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 FYI. Yeah, just 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 a just a message from the ad council. Like this is the kind of shit I grew up with, right? Like there's a generation of people. How about twice though? Well, there you go. See, L's L's got that galaxy brain. That's that's why we keep L around. It's got that fucking galaxy brain shit going on. Um <laughs> Hey Bobby. <laughs> um So, um, nut job McGee, um, fucking, what is it? Malding taco or whatever the fuck moron's name is suspended again. Um, for those of you that don't know what I'm actually talking about, bad empanada is permanently banned from Twitter, right? Permanently. So every time they open up a new uh, Twitter account and start screaming about anarchists fucking or what, they were on a tear about anarchists this time. Somebody just goes and fucking reports them and they get ban evasion. And so they fucking get tossed again. <laughs> They're permanently banned. They are not allowed on the Twitter platform. And if you're wondering why Malding Taco is not um, allowed on Twitter, it's because they've... Um, 
They've called for the murder and extermination of large swaths of people multiple times. <laughs> they, uh, you know, they've crossed a few lines a few times. Uh, but he's such an important figure. Oh, I, I just... Destiny's banned on Twitter, but still has an account somehow. How did, what did, uh, why did Destiny get banned? I don't follow, I don't follow this sort of stuff. Like it, for those of you coming from the surfs, I'm, I'm sort of notoriously like an isolationist when it comes to online spaces. I don't, I don't have time to understand what drama Vosh has gotten himself into this week or has Destiny released a new N-word manifesto that has stirred the community, right? Like I don't, I can't. I can't. I got so many spoons. Um, uh, so many reasons, so many times. <laughs> uh, <laughs> tell me you're an idiot without telling me you're an idiot. Moldy Panate <laughs> Panate, hold my beer. Um <clears throat> You diggeth. I diggeth. I don't, mean, I don't know who Vosh and Disney are. <laughs> I know people talk about them. Uh, <laughs> at this point, Destiny is just 20% tattoos of the N-word. Um, I Textures, look, I, it's all online drama. It's all online drama at the end of the day. Which is good for viewership, I guess. It's definitely good for viewership. But uh, for me, it's just, I can't. I don't have the fucking energy. Uh, Axel. Oh, yeah. Big time. <laughs> hey, Juno. Um, yeah, he argues it on the regular. Like, he... he I, I don't... Look, I don't even know... I don't even know if Destiny is pro N-word usage. I think Destiny's just pro him having a whole bunch of fucking people on his channel. And so, like, once every, like, 12 months, he releases some manifesto onto Twitter arguing how, like, he should be allowed to say the N-word. And everybody just starts losing their shit. And his viewership spikes. I, 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 th I think it might just be grift, quite frankly. Like, and I mean, to be perfectly honest, if it is just grift, if it is literally just grift, I, I get it. Chris Marcus. Um, money is a thing people like to acquire. It is, L. It is. Um, yeah. If, if, if it is literally just 100% grift, fair enough. I get it. Controversy sells. Like a little yip yip dog humping your leg describes all the debate bros. Oh, Bidouin, you're not wrong. I mean, he wouldn't even end up in the hospital. He could, honestly, Destiny could come on the air and fucking, fucking drop an end bomb and his viewership would spike. His viewership would spike. I'm telling you, he, he'd probably have, he'd probably have a 15% increase for like a couple of weeks. Yeah. It would, it would probably fucking work. Axel, I don't think he'd get a perma ban. I think he's too popular. I think he'd probably get like maybe a 24 day suspension or something like that. I don't think he'd get a perma ban. I, I think he's entirely too popular. We know how Twitch runs. If you drive revenue, 
you'd be surprised what Twitch will look the other way on. If you drive revenue, Twitch will fucking... So, I think he'd be fine. He's already de-partnered, though. Eh. L, wait. Are you saying Twitch is all about the money? Hey, Juno. I said hi to you before, Juno. Um... Yeah, Jay, seriously, skip it. Um, so if you're rich enough, the horse porn is probably fine. Yeah. I, I, wait, hang on. I bet, I bet his son could get away with like a clip of a horse porn. He'd, he'd catch a three day or maybe a 10 day or something like that, but I think he could get away with it. Hassan's big enough. Hassan could get away with horse porn. Sit. You heard it here first. <laughs> Texture. It's it's <laughs> L. Um it is sort of a running joke because we did. We talked about a few things prior to Vosh doing hot takes that were basically similar to what we talked about the few days before he talked about it. And we've seen him here before. Right? So it's it's it is sort of a like it, channel lore in joke that occasionally Vosh comes by to steal our opinions. Um, <laughs> I, for the record, I don't think he does that at all, but for the record, he hundred percent does that. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. hundred percent, hundred fucking percent. Okay. I have always been about the copybaras from day one and fucking Vosh comes along and starts talking about the fucking copy bars. You know what, Vosh? Keep the copy bars out of your mouth. Um. <laughs> hey, Flywing. Uh, you like the frogs personally? To each their own. Um. <clears throat> Dude, GL, I had to have it explained to me. Luckily, I've got people in community that can catch me up and um, keep me up to date on stuff like that. Um, as far as I'm concerned, yeah, whatever. Oh, um, well, uh, sweet. That isn't an aspect of what I fucking heard about it. The last, what I was informed, Cat, uh, Cat gave me a. Uh, um, Cat gave me like a compressed version. Apparently, um, whoever RGR is, by the way, like uh, completely unfamiliar whoever the fuck that was, right? No idea. Never heard of him. Um, but she apparently was doing some like non binary erasure third position fucking shtick. Um, it, apparently it was sort of like cementing in binary sexualities and binary gender constructs, um, and sort of erasing the non-binary position to a certain extent or trying to encapsulate it into some third positionalist bullshit. So... Oh, Jesus Christ. Parents who take their kids to pride events are committing child abuse. Nonsense. I, I see this is this is why I don't get involved. I don't get involved. Cat posted the screed to uh, to Discord. It's in here somewhere. There's, I mean, the Discord's too active for that sort of thing for me to keep up with it. But um, oh, it's in here somewhere. Let me let me scroll for a while. Yeah, here we go. Fucking this and then this and then this. And then this. No, I'm good. I, I'm 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 good. Like uh, that's. Can I shout me out since Tinder's not working for me? You should go for it, Viva. Um. Yeah, excellent. No, hundred percent, 
hundred percent. That was, I was like, you know, somebody needs to tell me what the fuck this is about because in no way, shape or form do I give a shit enough to read this, right? Like this is, this is, I'm sorry, go fuck yourself. I, I don't, I mean, here, here you go. Hang on. Let me pop this. Yeah. Yeah. If you go bare feet while hanging out with foot fetishists, this is a sex act. Good to know. Um, here's here's how you don't. Here's how you know you don't care. Here's 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 how you you know you don't care. All right. I'll just I'll I'll make this real simple for the lot of you. Right. The complete discussion of gender begins with breaking down the subject into three questions. The ontological question, what is gender? The epistemic, ep epistemic question, how do we know what someone's gender is? And the ethical question of how do we treat information in respect to one's gender? This is going to be a slog of a conversation. It's going to be a slog of a conversation, right? Oh, there's the argument that if you identify as some other xenogender or third gender, not only is it meaningless, but actively transphobic. construction at my house so late to the party anything interesting about um yeah cupcake a surf raid um but other than that we're just sort of i'm i'm in a i'm in a mood i'm kind of depressed um basic guard that kink at pride was sexual and offensive but bargaining for pay for child abuse wait, was merely transactional not sexual because they hadn't engaged in the sexual act wait what Okay. All right. She said that to somebody who was trafficked as a child. <laughs> oh, oh my god. <laughs> Holy shit. Oh, I couldn't imagine being that fucked in the head. <laughs> oh my god, that's fucking hilarious. And keep in mind, I have a very dark sense of humor. Forgive me for laughing at this, but that is fucking hilarious. To think that you're in the right and that you go there. Oh my God, that's so fucked up. That's so fucked up. Holy shit. To, to say that to somebody who was actively trafficked as a child. Holy shit, man. That takes, dude, that takes, uh, that takes some fucking gumption for sure. Holy shit. What portion of your brain isn't functioning to be able to say that to somebody? Yeah, that's fine. That's just, that's, that's transactional. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> that's fucking amazing. Holy fuck, man. 
Oh. All right. <laughs> All right. Here's the link. Oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, her and Vosh wrote it off as lawyer brain. She was being too analytical. Fuck that noise. Um, oh, that's... Dude, that's fucking... I've, I've, I, you know what? I've slipped up and said some shit before, but I've never done anything bullshit like that, right? Like I've, I've fucked up. I've been coming off of fuck, uh, Xanax before and just freshly woken up and then gone on somebody's air and said transsexual instead of transgender, right? Like I've, I've misspoken. I've fucked up. I've owned it, right? Like I've talked about topics that were inappropriate at the time, but in no way, shape or form. Have I ever fucked up like that? Holy fuck, man. Like, how do you fuck? Oh, man, that's good. That's fucking amazing. Holy shit. Yeah, that makes that makes me feel good as a streamer. At least I haven't fucked up that badly. Uh, Where's uh, Akka? Okay, Akka's working on that link. L, was that an argument that she actually tried to make? That being attracted to feed is gross and degenerate and therefore pedophilic? Is that an actual argument she attempted to make? <laughs> so... This person's running for local office, aren't they? Like, didn't I hear that? Like, cat, cat passed that that tidbit on to me. Aren't they like involved in actual politics? Like, showing feet in public for your foot fetishist partner with kids around is pedophilic. Okay. All right. I at least I at least get the argument then. They're studying to be a lawyer. I I don't. Whatever. Good job, Cricks. Wait, they're also wait. Uh, Zagorsk. Yeah, apparently so. Apparently so. That that it's a fair comparison. It's one hundred percent fair comparison. Um, spot on. By that logic, if a guy likes breasts and his partner uh, and his partner wears a low cut top in public, is that also pedophilic? Yes. Apparently so. Um, oh, fuck me. Man, I got a lot of stuff wrong with me and my life is not great. I, I'm, I'm, I would, I would, I would trade with most people, but at least I don't, I'm not running around making these, like doing these hot takes. Right. At least, at least I haven't fucking told a, a sex trafficking victim, like a child sex trafficking victim, um, to their face that one, what, the, what occurred to them was purely transactional. Right. Like at least I haven't fucked up on that level. Hey shrimps. I'm not. I'm not. I'm hitting. I'm hitting a new low with my with my neuropathy. It'd be the best argument. At least I'm not a total idiot like that person. Yeah, I know, right? Um, yeah. Hey, shrimps, though. Um, no, I'm having a rough time. Um, and they're being inflammatory for talking about it when it was in context. I, I just, I couldn't imagine. <laughs> I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine. Yeah, uh, peaky physical therapy will not help with this. <clears throat> um, 
it was it was pretty dark last night. It got pretty dark last night. I mean, I, I you know, yeah. I was, uh, yeah, not doing well. I, you know, yeah, it got their name out. I, I didn't know who the fuck this RGR person was. I mean, now I know who they are. They're a fucking idiot. <laughs> oh, but. I mean, it's probably, probably not their intention. <laughs> um, you got kicked from her server. I mean, you know, um, yeah, that's it's actually sad as fuck how awful they are. I, I uh Monasu, thank you. Um, cow poker is a degradation of well, neuropathy is a degradation of the nerve cells. Um, mine is small fiber, so it's the uh, nerve cells related to uh, hot, cold, vibration, and pain. This is what small fiber nerve cells uh, transmit sensations for. So, yeah, like right now, my feet and basically like everything from my thigh, like halfway down my thigh, down to my feet, feels like it's on fire. My hands are buzzing and mildly burning. Um, I'm in pain basically 24 hours a day. Yeah, it's um, and it's recently spread to other areas. Um, I don't know, Karina. I don't know what their deal with the, the binary is. Um, but cow poker, there's no relief. <laughs> Once the nerve is damaged, the nerve is damaged. I mean, it's, it's an idiopathic process. I, I have my suspicions, but nobody, um, it, Manus, it, it hasn't, it hasn't done much for me. How's sleep? Um, when I wake up, I'm sad I woke up. <laughs> um, yeah. Weed is very hit and miss. Very hit and miss. Um, it can enhance it. It can make it like that. Um, it can make it so that I feel the sensation more. Yeah, it's it. Weed can be rough for that. Um, and also, um, my headspace for being high gets a little, little nightmarish. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. High on weed, you get introspective, you start thinking. It's not good. It's not good. So, yeah. Weed doesn't help alleviate depression for me. Weed sort of just makes it worse. Weed is weak stuff on Kai's system and it isn't easy to relax anymore. Am I wrong? No, it's you're right. The only thing that really works for me to relax anymore is something along the lines of like Xanax and I can't take it more than like once a week or else I'll probably put a bullet in my fucking brain. Um, sorry to be dark about it, but I mean, it's true. Um, duly noted. Um, duly noted, Corey. Snappy! It is. It is. It's up there. Neuropathic pain is kind of the worst. Um, it, um, opiates don't affect it. Yeah, I, fig I figure as much, Corey. Um, Viva, that's, that's, that's like gabapentin and shit. Yeah.
try, try number four, three. Um, B school, I've considered that as well. Um, I need to, I need to make an appointment with my fucking room temperature better for worse. Um, turd, hot, 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 hot. The, the only relief I truly get in this world is it extraordinarily hot, like water, just a bath that, that sort of thing. So. I don't know what that one is. Gabatril. Hmm. All right. Yeah, just looking at it, Rex. Yeah, thanks. I, I, Do they have spicy swimming pools? Uh, no. No, they do not. Um, hey, hey, okay. Um, all right, that's coming. Oh, I know what it's from. There we go. I was just hearing a pop in my audio feedback. I was like, where the fuck is that pop coming from? But I know what it's coming from, and I just killed it. Um, do you know how much pain in the ass um, it would be, Aka, to do an on-location hot spring stream? So who wants a who wants nightmare fuel? Anybody want nightmare fuel? And when I when I tell you it's pretty bad, just trust me, it's pretty bad. Um, as far as I know, it's completely TOS, but it's it's bad. Um, all right, Karina. Um. They're trying to stop reset wars. Fuck. All right. Well, I mean, this, this, y'all did it to yourselves. Know that. I gave you the option, and not a single person said no. <clears throat> You want the worst part? We're pretty sure we know who she is. And it's way worse. I'm not going to name... Look. It's, it's bad. It's bad. Um, by the way... The child is likely in that photo nine years of age. Um, if the research behind the photo is accurate, the child is nine. Um, the child allegedly 
was the daughter of a billionaire who we know. Um, and it's not Trump. It's not Trump. It's not Trump. But, um, the person whose daughter it might be has ties outside of that photo and that daughter to Epstein and potential child trafficking as well. Uh, no, not software guy. Um, it is, um, hedge fund guy. Oops. Money. It's, it's money. It's hedge fund. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there is a high probability that, nope, not Soros. Um, none of you, none of you know, I, 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 Swede might know who this person is. Swede might know who this person is. Outside of, uh, outside of Swede, I doubt many of you would even know who this person is. Like I could drop their name in chat and you'd be like who the fuck is that right outside of this context i could just randomly put their name in chat and you'd be like i don't know who that is there but you know yeah swede would probably know though um <clears throat> cassidy would as well um This applause is for one person in particular who would rarely get applause on this channel. Congratulations, Petey. Congratulations, Petey. Yep. That's who it is highly suspect. Multiple uh, power of Google. Mm, that's a shame. I was ho I was hoping you got it on your own. Um, yeah, it's Dubin. Um, they suspect. There's no guarantee on that, but independent investigators um, literally. Um, yeah, it's in there. It's just. Um, it's probably at a different level or something. Um, Kirby Summers, um, who's a sexual abuse survivor and advocate, um, literally said, like, if we figured out who the girl on Epstein's lap was and, you know, why didn't news agencies figure it out? So, yeah. But... Either way, either way, it's a very disturbing photo.
just a reminder, just a reminder, just, just a reminder. Don't take medical advice from somebody who has more concussions than years in school. Just, just, just a piece of advice. Oh, and FYI, um, hey, Connor, before he struck it big, he was on welfare. Okay. Right before he struck it big, he was on welfare. Just, just a reminder. Um, I don't know tech support. I, I love um, I love that Randian hypocrisy. Um, when he struck it, he was still getting checks. Nice. Um, I love that Randian hypocrisy. I, I absolutely adore it. Yeah. Fucking nobody should be able to get welfare. Stop leeching off the system as she dies on social security and, uh, and welfare and food assistance. Yeah. Gotta love that Randian objectivism. <laughs> Dr. Linguini legs over here. Uh, got mine. Pull up the ladder. Exactly. Um, oh, and I have a thing here I wanted to look at. So, in 1997, Wired Magazine published 10 things that could go wrong in the 21st century. And this is a low resolution copy. I wish I had a higher resolution one, but 10 scenario spoilers. All right. Here are 10 things. Okay, so the long boom is is a scenario, one possible future. It's built upon the convergence of many big forces and even little pieces falling into place, all of them with a positive twist. The future, of course, could turn out to be very different, particularly if a few of those big pieces go haywire. Here are 10 things that could cut the long boom short. Interesting tech support. One, tensions between China and the U.S. escalate into a new Cold War, bordering on a hot one. Two, new technologies turn out to be a bust. They simply don't bring the expected productivity increases or the big economic boosts. Three, Russia develops a kleptocracy run by a mafia or retreats into quasi-communistic nationalism that threatens Europe. Four, Europe's inter integration process grinds to a halt. Eastern and Western Europe can't finesse a reunification and even the European Union process breaks down. Five, major ecological crises cause a global climate change that, among other things, disrupts the food supply, causing big price increases everywhere and sporadic famines. Six, major rise in crime and terrorism forces the world to pull back in fear. People who constantly uh, feel that they could be blown up or ripped off are not in the mood to reach out and open up. Seven, cumulative escalation and pollution causes a dramatic increase in cancer, which overwhelms an ill-prepared Ill health system. Eight, energy prices go through the roof. Convulsions in the Middle East disrupt the oil supply and alternative energy sources fail to materialize. Nine, an uncontrollable plague... A modern-day influenza epidemic or its equivalent takes off like wildfire, killing upwards of 200 million people or 10. And 10, a social and cultural backlash stops progress dead in its tracks. Human beings need to choose to move forward. They just may not. Wired, July 1997. <laughs> oh... I, you know, <laughs> 10 for 10, 10 for 10. <laughs> Imagine writing that. Imagine writing that. Yeah. Yeah. Wither. Hang on. 
Shared content with her. Shared content. Later, Bidouin. I, f I, I wish I, I wish I had that option, Bidouin. Thank you, though. Sleep well. I, I. <laughs> Imagine writing that, and fucking looking back. I wonder. Yeah, is the writer a time traveler? Oh, a slightly better resolution. Oh, um, and for those of you who want, there you go. It'll pop up in a second. There's the archive.org of the scan of the, uh, of the magazine. It's, it's real. Like that's. Um, you know what? I'm going to delete that version and I'm going to fucking put a better version in there. There you go. Um, yeah, it's real. Wired is run by time travelers. Confirmed. Um, so it was a how to guy. <laughs> um, God damn um, God damn it. You weren't supposed to read 1948 like a how-to guide, you fucking idiots. Um, so you're going to see, an, you're going to see news going around that Target is keeping its stores closed on Thanksgiving for good. And the first, your first instinct is going to be like, yeah, fuck yeah, good, fuck, you know, let's, yes. Like, more of that. Um, here's the thing. One, they could reverse that decision at any time. But two, actually what they're doing is manipulating the payrolls. Yes, the employees are not required to come in on Thanksgiving. They're required to come in at, wait for it, 11.15 a.m., uh-huh. And due to the way they're kajiggering their schedules, basically they're eliminating overtime pay. They're eliminating holiday and overtime pay. Yes. So like the time and a half that employees would have gotten for having to work on Thanksgiving, they're not getting, but they're still required to come in to set up for everything else that's backloaded onto thanks the Thanksgiving holiday because Black Friday is a retail holiday not a legal holiday. So, oh yeah. Yeah, so just, you know, remember the next time you see that sort of article. Yeah. Hey, Bri. Dig it. I used to have a buddy that would have those conversations at like every, um, not surprised, Petey. Not surprised. Um, Brie. Duly noted. Um, hey there, Brie. No such thing as a benevolent retail chain. I know, right? What a concept. Um, one of the things I like to do as a customer is speak. There's a lot of stores that I don't go to regularly, right? Like Walmart and fucking Walgreens and Target and shit like that. Like I don't go to them on any sort of regular basis, right? Um, one of my favorite things to do, though, is if I'm there, 
is to have very um, sort of above average volume conversations with the employees about poor retail working conditions and how unionization is the fix for a lot of these issues. You know, just 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 to create some waves from time to time. Because the employees will get shit if they do it. But if a customer does it, um, Zerum, uh, it depends. It depends. Sometimes the, the employees are just like, just trying to get through their day and they don't give a shit. Other times they're receptive. Other times they've drank the cool, uh, the flavor aid. Uh, they've drank the cool aid. Other times they seem nervous, like legitimately like, you know, fucking looking at the manager and shit. Syndicalist perks up. Someone say unionization? The customer's always right unless they're left. Um, do you want to get banned from a store? Because this is how you get banned from a store. Um, that's why I said you don't do it at stores that you you need to use. <laughs> Just, you know, stores that you randomly like, eh, fucking I'm driving by and I need to get a thing. Stop by and speak your piece. That's a good idea, turd. That's actually a really good idea. I'm thinking something along this line. I had to look up who or what that was nonsense. Anything union will irritate. Alright. They have like Yeah, they have a sports gray. Alright. Yeah, I think I might get one of those. Had no idea who it was. Peaky. Nighttime and weekends. Nighttime and weekends. Graveyard and weekends. Yep. 100%. <laughs> it. Nice. Wait, what we got? I sell it. <laughs> nice tech support. Good work. Um, okay.
Okay. Well, that's weird. That was weird as shit. Uh, you diggeth? Not really. I'm more of a book person. Oh, what's his name? TJ Miller? TJ Miller, right? <sighs> to be fair, dude had like actual issues with his brain. Like, oh, Thomas Middleditch. Really? I didn't know that. Sexual misconduct. I mean, he's a swinger. Huh. Um. I mean, that's just par for the course with her. That's just par for the course. Uh, Kala Sapakan? Uh, Kala Sabakin says two Richmond police officers assaulted her as she was filming them arrest a homeless woman, a woman near the Whole Foods on West Broad Street last month. The police have charged her with trespassing and obstruction of justice. Cool reason for her to be. Is she being retained against her will? Is she being retained against her will? Sabakan. Uh, okay. I do. I'm a citizen and I am so I. and I am protecting the rights of people who are in need. That that is my purpose. I'm protecting the rights against people who are in need. Who are, what? are in need. So if she is, if this is private property and they don't want her on the property, I can uh, uh, tell, tell her where she can go, where she can be at, at, at comfort and not be harassed. And if you're telling me that she is unable to leave this area, then that means that you are retaining her against her will. And I will post this video. Yeah, you can come with me, ma'am. You can you can come with. You diggeth. What part of town you in? I'm down on the south side. Yeah, yeah, with her African, African. <clears throat> um. Nice. Um. Yeah, I was there for the uh, the homeless criminalization. Baptist ministry and the food, not bombs. Yeah. Fucking can't feed the homeless. Fuck you. Let's go feed the homeless. Um, 
We got that one overturned, though. So, uh, good on you. Um, if you ever want, if you ever want to chill, um, may I'll show you where you can. She can't come with you. What? Why can't? Why is she under arrest? She has a warrant. How does she have a warrant and you don't have her name? How does she have a warrant and you don't have her name? Where's the trespassing warrant? Ma'am, where's the trespassing warrant? You need to step away. I am protecting the rights are, of citizens. I am protecting job. the right of citizens. You, you started by saying Wait. that she was. Diggeth, Diggeth, I haven't been physically active for quite a number of years just because dealing with the pain. Just trying to keep this body, like I'm trying to rehab this body and keep it in one fucking piece, but no. Um, was sleeping on a bench. You started by saying she was sleeping on a bench. No, I'm, I'm going to have her banned from the property by the owner. You need to you need to leave this area because they can't you need to leave this area because they cannot arrest you for something that you have not done. You need to leave this area. If you stay here, they will try to arrest you, which they are trying to do right now. There is no trial. Do not stop. You, if you she did a crime, then you would have arrested her at the very we can't start. Stop you from recording, but you need to, you need to get out of our space. I'm recording right? and I'm That's trying to persuade her there. to leave the area. You can record over there. She's come with, come with me, ma'am. Come with me because she is under arrest. She, why haven't you, you arrested her yet? Why haven't you, if she's under arrest, why haven't you, you arrested her yet? I, I, I am publicly walking. And I'm trying to it. help somebody who is in need. He said she's not in need. He goes, she's not in need. She's a fucking homeless immigrant trying to exist. Like, she's the definition of in need. Oh, I don't fucking, um, yeah, diggeth. I don't, diggeth. Best way to keep in touch with me is to use our Discord server. I don't fucking, dude, I'll, I'll add you on Twitter, but I don't use Twitter, like, at all. And, like, I mean, I don't have an Instagram account. So, like, um, let's see. There we go. Follow. Added. But yeah, um, yeah, our Discord server is the easiest way to keep in touch with me. Um, and exclamation Discord if you need it. Ma'am, you can walk. You can walk with walk me away. because Please they, they, they have not. They have not. They, they are holding <laughs> Text you support. against your will if you stay here. Gets for I'm not obstructing anything. I'm standing in a in a public place. You need to quit telling her to come with you because she is not coming with you. Ma'am, ma'am, you can you can walk away from this situation. They're trying they're trying to detain you unlawfully. They're trying to detain you unlawfully. Does she have the right to walk away from this situation? No, she does not. She is under arrest by the law enforcement at this point. How how and why? I have something to say to you. I'm sorry, you're on private property. I'm in the street. It's private property. The street is private property. So I am protecting the rights of a woman who is, has been harassed for the past 10 minutes. You, are, you have been asked to leave private property. I am recording, I am recording, I am recording a, a incident of harassment for arresting a lady who has, who is sitting on a bench. And these people are stating that she is she is being detained against her will.
Uh, not off the top of my head, but um, oh, and it's gonna be different. It's gonna be different. That's a that's a three part question. It's a three part question, Rev. It would be North Las Vegas, Las Vegas, and Henderson. Um. Oh, no, no, that road can 100% be a private road. 100%. That entire facility you're looking at can be private. You guys are looking at a road and thinking that there's like a public easement off of the road. That could be a private road. I'm not kidding you. Like, yeah. Yeah, Bobby. Yeah, Vegas has huge campuses that are all private. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, the whole that whole fucking complex is guaranteed to be, be uh, guaranteed to be private property. I zippy. Yeah. Uh, whether you're you're thinking school, right? You heard campus and you thought school. Campus doesn't necessarily equal school. There, like businesses can refer to like a campus. It's it's traditionally where a college is laid out, but no, in modern connotation, a campus could be like just it's it's derived derived from field 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 field. I want to say field. Field. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, basically campus just means a large field <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's not necessarily like, yeah. Yeah. It looks like a business park. Yeah, exactly. Um, So, 100%, that whole fucking thing is almost guaranteed to be private private property. Which, by the way, fuck private property. Um, it's usually now referred to as a collection of buildings all related to a business. Hmm. Um, yeah, just one of the many reasons private property is a problematic idea. One of the many reasons. Oh. Which reminds me, we need to do more reading theory, but honestly, I so don't feel it. I'm just not. I'm not feeling it. So. I kind of want to read other theory. I'm s sick of doing the anti-ANCAP theory. <laughs> Night, Okra. Um, take care of yourself, Okra. Want to talk inflation? I mean, not really. <laughs> Is there something happening with inflation that we should be informed about, Swede? Uh, Diggeth, yes, usually. Um, but I don't think you have to. Tech support. We're almost done, though. We're not almost done. We're fucking 8.5, 8.4. No, 8.5. We're on 8.5, which means we have 8.6, 8.7, 9, 10, 10 10.1. Wait, is there 10? No. Okay, so we have 8.5, 6, 7, 9, 10, 1, 10, 2, 10, 3, 11, 1, 11, 11, 1, 11, 2, 12, uh, 3, 4, 5, 6. We're not almost done.
What would a world without private property be like? Um, a lot less competitive. Good set of data that ruins the inflation hawk narrative posted in the shared content. Um, I, Corey, I don't, I don't get it either. You mean more literally? Um, I don't know what you mean by more literally. Uh, there would be. It would take a it would take a reordering of society. Um, commune. It would take a fundamental ground up reordering of society to accomplish uh, like a world without private property. Um, once you de once you decommodify and deprivatize the means of production and the commons, things get different. Things get different. Um, so it would take a reordering of society to accomplish that. A lot less. Karina, a lot less. Um, Diggeth, 100%. Yeah. Uh, commune. Basically, um, you would have to have uh, usage and um, you would have to reorder your... Um, property system around usage rights basically rather than ownership rights um, then you would have to have a means test for who gets to occupy those spaces who is utilizing those spaces the utilization metrics of those spaces how those uh, how the utilization is purposed for the good of the community primarily um, and not the individuals it would literally take a reordering of society um, which we need. It's not going to happen in our lifetime. Um, but yeah. Commune, most, most of the things um, start with people. Legislation is a goofy fucking idea, right? Most of the things in this world start with people. More like um, you're thinking means testing, like, do you have the, the fucking cash to cover, right? No, not, not like that. Means testing, like, does this fulfill the required set of needs for societal usage, right? Like, yeah, you can occupy the property. Yeah, you can occupy the space. Yeah, you can have usage rights. But if your usage isn't meeting the standards of the society, then it should be cycled off to somebody who is, right? If all you're doing is using it for the good of the few rather than the good of the many, then that would be tested differently, right? Um, hey. Hey, Squiddy. How did your stream go? And no, before you ask, I'm not well. Uh, <laughs> uh, commune, it could apply to everything. It could apply to a lot of stuff. Um, God, we need to do it. Wait, what is this, Swede? Um, all right, we need to, I, I need to do it. I need to do it. Let's see. Eight, five is how long? Eight, six is how long? Eight, seven is how long? We need to do all three of these. We do. We need to kill ca chapter eight. Uh, Christian lobbyists be a dickhead. I mean, do they know how to do anything other than be a dickhead? Oops, wrong button entirely. Uh, there we go. All right, let me start killing off alerts here. 
So I can do a reading. Oh God, we so we just need to. I, you're right. I need to fucking whoever whoever told me we're close. You're you're wrong, but you're right in pushing me. Ah. Oh. All right. Kill the overlay entirely. Um, all right. For those of you who don't know what's about to happen, um, basically I am reading from a document that is miles long. Um, too late, Zippy. I turned them off. Um, it is essentially a um, why, why ANCAPs aren't anarchists, right? Like that's, that's what it's about. This entire fucking document is about taking the piss out of the, the ANCAP, uh, rhetoric. Um, so, so far we're over eight hours. I think we're up to eight and a half hours. It's on a playlist, um, on YouTube and <laughs> Wither is the sword master in the night. Um, yeah, I can get you a link to the document. Every every um, every YouTube video. Um, if you want, fuck and caps. There you go. Is the command, and there's the the playlist. Uh, diggeth the actual document as read thus far is eight and a half hours long. Yeah. Um, it's going to be, um, uh, no, no, Corey. Um, it's going to be close to 10. Um, it's going to be a little over 10 maybe, but it's going to be close to 10. Um, and then I am never discussing end caps with anybody outside of, um, they're not anarchists. Go watch the YouTube playlist. And if you watch that playlist in its entirety and come back, then I will discuss ANCAPs with you. Beyond that, no. I'm never going to talk about fucking ANCAPs again beyond the, um, the, the, line that I have been using since the beginning that there is no such thing as an anarcho-capitalism. Anarchism is about a collapsing down of hierarchical power structures into a heterarchy or horizontal organizational structure and a dismantling of unjust authority and power mechanisms wherever they may lie. Capitalism is inherently hierarchical, inherently coercive, and inherently oppressive. Therefore, you cannot have anarcho-capitalism. That is a misnomer. It is an inorganic bad faith attempt at uh, providing people political cover for their shit positions. That will be the furthest that I will discuss and caps once I get this done. Squid, oh Lord, it's so long. Is this written by you? I wish it were. No, it's a compilation of it, it is is it is multiple people working on a project, Squid. Um yes. Corey segmented every every section, every chapter has sections, and every section has its own video on on the YouTube playlist. I did, Zippy. I did. There is a shibboleth in it. <clears throat> hey Crimson. Uh, we still got a meme on them, right? I mean, you know. When as as when appropriate. When appropriate. Um Zippy, I saw the meme. Um, <laughs> hang on, let me bring it up. Um, so... Let me close that tab. Bring that tab. Refresh, refresh, 8.4. Okay. I posted my meme and memes. Good, good, <laughs> good zippy. Um, 
All right. I'm going to try and get three sections done here. So I know theory reading is not the most entertaining and not the most exciting thing in the world, but it's for a good cause. It's for a good reason. It's for taking the piss out of the fucking and caps. Um, oh, before I forget, actually, here. Um, fuck is that? Why did it just vibrate? Um, interesting. Um, where is it? <clears throat> there we go. So everybody has this. I want everybody to have this. Okay. Basically, the father of ANCAPs is a guy by the name of Murray Rothbard, right? We've talked about Murray Rothbard it quite extent uh, to uh, quite an extent within this document. Um, <laughs> Corey, um, we've talked about von von Mises. We've talked about Hayek. We've talked about Hoppe. We've talked about Rothbard. We've talked about Nozick. But the father of like anarcho capitalism is this guy by the name of Murray Rothbard. And you can find on the Mises Institute daily articles written by Murray Rothbard, okay? Article was written in the mid-1950s, but under Rothbard's pseudonym. And in this document, what you can find, let me uh, do this. Okay, this is the father of anarcho-capitalism. We must therefore conclude that we are not anarchists and that those who call us anarchists are not on firm etymological ground and are being completely unhistorical. So, next time you're in an argument with an ANCAP and they're arguing that they're anarchists, they're is a Mises Institute link to a Murray Rothbard authored article in which he explicitly states ANCAPs aren't anarchists. So you have that. Oh, they're just minarchists. They're they're anti-statist capitalists. Yeah, that's all. They're just anti-statist capitalists. All right. Oh, oh Lord, here we go. At least my throat's in a little bit better condition this week. Uh. <laughs> um. And bookmarked. Um, all right, here we go. So you know I won't address chat while I'm doing a section. I will pause between sections. Um, and, like, you know, talk about anything we need to talk about. Uh, Kirky Taki, thank you for the follow. It's not going to pop up on screen. I've got alerts disabled right now. Uh, we're about to do some theory reading. Um, but, yes, I, I won't be going to chat while I'm doing reading. Just so you know, um, people who have been here before for it know the deal. Um, but use chat, talk amongst yourselves, like, you know, comment on the things that I'm commenting on, you know, use it to its full extent. But I'm going to just do the reading for the section. I will start the recording, stop the recording, start the recording, stop the recording, that sort of thing. Um, either way, here we go. <clears throat> Chapter 8, Section 5. What about the lack of enclosures in the Americas? The enclosure movement was but one way of creating the land monopoly, which ensured the creation of a working class. The circumstances facing the ruling class in the Americas were, distinct, were distinctly different than that in the old world, and so the land monopoly took a different form there. In the, 
in the Americas, enclosures were unimportant as customary land rights didn't really exist. Here, the problem was that, well, after the original users of the land were um, eliminated, of course, there were vast tracts of land available for people to use. Just scoot on over. Thanks. Just keep scooting on over. Thanks. Um, unsurprisingly, there was a movement towards independent farming, and this pushed up the price of labor by reducing the supply. Capitalists found it difficult to find workers willing to work for them at wages low enough to provide them with sufficient profits. It was, due, uh, in, uh, it was due the difficulty in finding cheap enough labor that capitalists in America then turned to slavery. All things being equal, wage labor is more productive than slavery. But in early America, all things were not equal. Having access to cheap, indeed free, land meant that working people had a choice and few desired to become wage slaves. Because of this, capitalists turned to slavery in the South and the land monopoly in the North and West. This was because, in the words of Maurice Dobbs, it became clear to those who wished to reproduce capitalist relations of production in the new country that the foundation stone of their endeavor must be the restriction of land ownership to a minority and the exclusion of the majority from any share in productive property. Studies in Capitalist Development, pages 221 and 222. As one radical historian puts it, when land is free or cheap, as it was in different regions of the United States before the 1830s, there was no compulsion for farmers to introduce labor-saving technology. As a result, independent household production hindered the development of capitalism by allowing large portions of the population to escape wage labor. Charlie Post, The Agricultural Revolution in the United States, pages 216 to 228, published in Science Society, Science and Society, volume uh, 61, number 2, page 221. It was precisely this option, i.e. of independent production, that had to be destroyed in order for capitalist industry to develop. The state had to violate the holy laws of supply and demand by controlling the access to land in order to ensure the normal workings of supply and demand in the labor market, i.e. that the bargaining position on the labor market favored employer over employee. Once this situation became the typical one, i.e. when the option of self-employment was effectively eliminated, a protectionist-based laissez-faire approach could be adopted and state action used only to protect private property from the actions of the dispossessed. So, how was this transformation of land ownership achieved? Instead of allowing settlers to appropriate their own farms, as was the case before the 1830s, the state stepped in once the army had cleared out the, <laughs> let's say, original users. Its first major, uh, major role was to enforce legal rights of property on unused land. Land stolen from the Native Americans was sold at auction to the highest bidders, namely speculators who then sold it on to farmers. This process started right after the, revo uh, right after the revolution when huge sections of land were brought up, uh, bought up by rich speculators and their claims supported by the law. Howard Zinn, People's History of the United States, page 125. Thus, land which should have been free was sold to land-hungry farmers and the few enriched themselves at the expense of the many. Not only did this increase inequality within society, it, was it also encouraged the development of wage labor. Having to pay for land would, uh, would have ensured that many immigrants remained on the East Coast until they had enough money. Thus, a pool of people with little option but to sell their labor was increased due to state protection of unoccupied land. That the land usually ended up in the hands of farmers did not, could not, countermand the shift in class forces in, that this policy created. This was also the essential role of the various homesteading acts. And in general, the federal land law in the 19th century provided for the sale of most of the public domain at public option, uh, auction to the highest bidder. Actual settlers were forced to buy land from speculators at prices considerably above the federal minimum price, which few people could afford anyway. Charlie Post, again, citation, page 222. Little wonder the individualist anarchists supported an occupancy and use system of land ownership as a key way of uh, stopping capitalist and landlord usury as well as the development of capitalism itself. This change in the appropriation of land had significant effects on agriculture and the desirability of taking up farming for immigrants. As Post notes, 
when the social conditions for obtaining and maintaining possession of land change, as they did in the Midwest between 1830 and 1840, pursuing the goal of preserving family ownership and control produced very different results. In order to pay growing mortgages, debts, and taxes, family farmers were compelled to specialize in production towards cash crops and to market more and more of their output. So in order to, uh, so in order to pay for land, which was formerly, uh, let's call it free for lack of a better word, farmers got themselves into debt and increasingly turned to the market to pay it off. Thus, the federal land system, by transferring land into uh, by transforming land into a commodity and stimulating land speculation, made the Midwestern farmers dependent upon markets for the continual possession of their farms. Once on the market, farmers had to invest in new machinery, and this also got them further into debt. In the face of a bad harvest or a market glut, they couldn't repay their loans, and their farms had to be sold to do so. By 1880, 25% of all farms were rented by tenants. And the numbers kept rising. This means that Murray Rothbard's comment that, quote, once the land was purchased by the settler, the injustice disappeared. It's nonsense. It's rubbish. The injustice was transmitted to other parts of society. And this, along with the legacy of the original injustice, lived on and helped transform society towards capitalism. See The Ethics of Liberty, page 73. In addition, his comments about the establishment of North America of a truly libertarian land system would be one the individual an individualist anarchists would have seriously disagreed with. Thus, state action in restricting, in restricting free access to the land ensured that workers were dependent on wage labor. In addition, the transformation of social property relations in northern agriculture set the stage for the agricultural revolution of the 1840s and 1850s. Rising debts and taxes forced Midwestern fa family farmers to compete as commodity producers in order to maintain their land holdings. The transformation was the central precondition for the development of industrial capitalism in the United States. In addition to seizing the land and distributing it in such a way as to benefit capitalist industry, the government played its part in helping the bankers and hurting the farmers. It kept the amount of money based in the gold supply steady while the population rose, so there was less and less money in circulation. The farmer had to pay off his debts in dollars that were harder to get. The bankers getting loans back were getting dollars worth more than when they had loaned them out. A kind of interest on top of interest. That was why farmers' movements, like the individualist anarchists, we must add, talked about putting more money into circulation. Again, Howard's in People's History of the United States, page 278. Overall, therefore, state action ensured the transformation of America from a society of independent workers to a capitalist one. By creating and enforcing the land monopoly of which state ownership of unoccupied land and its enforcement of landlord rights were the most important, the state ensured that the balance of class forces tipped in favor of the capitalist class. By removing the option of farming your own land, the United States government created its own form of enclosure and the creation of a landless workforce with little option but to sell its liberty on the free market. This, com this combined with protectionism, ensuring the transformation of American society from pre-capitalist one into a capitalist one. There was nothing natural about anything of this process. Little wonder the individualist anarchist J.K. Ingalls attacked the land monopoly with the following words. The earth, with its vast resources of mineral wealth, its spontaneous productions and its fertile soil, the free gift of God and the common patrimony of mankind, has for long centuries been held in the grasp of one set of oppressors by right of conquest or right of discovery, and it is now held by another through the right of purchase. All of man's natural possessions have been claimed as property, nor has man himself escaped the insatiate jaws of greed. The invasion of the rights and possessions has resulted in clothing property with a power to accumulate an income. Ugh. You do realize that's not the opposite situation, Orion? That's the exact same situation that was being described? 
That's, that's literally the same. It's two sides of the same coin that we were talking about. Anyway, uh, it is what it is. Um, <clears throat> uh, either way. Section 8-6. What is 8-6? How long is 8-6? Oh, 8-7 is kind of long. Jesus. I mean, at least none of them are like the 45-minute length that we were doing. Um... All right, how long is nine? Nine is kind of long. Yeah, it's two sides. I don't even want to fucking bother. It's two sides of the same coin, my man. All right, let's... Kind of is. All right. All right, let's do the next section. Um, chapter 8, section 6. How did working people view the rise of capitalism? The best example of how hated capitalism was can be seen by the rise and spread of the socialist movement in all of its many forms across the world. It's no coincidence that the development of capitalism saw the rise of socialist theories. However, in order to fully understand how different capitalism was from previous economic systems, let's consider early capitalism in the U.S., which for many libertarians is the example of capitalism equals freedom argument. Early America was pervaded by artisan production, individual ownership of the means of production. Unlike capitalism, this system is not marked by the separation of the worker from the means of life. Most people did not have to work for another, and so they did not. As Jeremy Brick, uh, Brecker notes, in 1831, the great majority of Americans were farmers working their own land, primarily for their own needs. Most of the rest were self-employed artisans, merchants, traders, and other professionals. Other classes, employees and industrialists in the north, slaves and planters in the south, were actually relatively small, all things considered. The great majority of Americans were independent and free from anybody's command. These conditions created the high cost of combined wage labor, which ensured the practice of slavery continued to exist. However, towards the middle of the 19th century, the economy began to change. Capitalism began to be imported into American society as infrastructure was improved, which allowed markets for manufactured goods to grow. Soon, due to state-supported capitalist competition, artisan production was replaced by wage labor. Thus evolved modern capitalism. Many workers understood, resented, and opposed their increasing subjugation to their employers, the masters, to use Adam Smith's own expression. You know, the father of capitalism. Which could not be reconciled with the principles of freedom and economic independence that had marked American life and sunk deeply into the mass consciousness during the days of early economy. In 1854, for example, a, a group of skilled piano makers wrote, the day is far distant when they, the wage earners, will so far forget what is due to manhood as to glory in a system forced upon them by their necessity and in opposition to their feelings of independence and self-respect. May the piano trade be spared as, as such exhibitions of the degrading power of the day wage system. You can find this quote in um, Common Sense for Hard Times, page 26. Clearly, the working class did not consider working for a daily wage, in contrast to working for themselves and selling their own product, to be a step forward for liberty or individual dignity. The difference between selling the product of one's labor and selling one's labor, i.e. oneself, was seen and condemned. 
When the producer sold his product, he retained himself. But when he came to sell his labor, he sold himself. The extension of wage labor to the skilled worker was regarded by him as a symbol of a deeper change. Norman Ware, The Industrial Worker, 1840-1860. Indeed, one group of workers argued that they were, quote, slaves in the strictest sense of the word, as they had to toil from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same for our masters, I masters, and for our daily bread. You can find the same citation, Industrial Worker, 1840-1860, on page 42. Another argued that the factory system contains itself the elements of slavery. We think no sound reasoning can deny, and every day continues to add power to its incorporate sovereignty, while the sovereignty of the working people decreases in the same degree. Almost as soon as there were wage workers, there were strikes, machine breaking, riots, unions, and many other forms of resistance. John Zerzan's argument that there was, quote, a relentless assault on the workers' historical rights to free time, self-education, craftsmanship, and play was at the heart of the rise of the factory system. It's extremely accurate. You see more on that in the Elements of Refusal, page 105. It was an assault that workers resisted with all their might. In response to being subjected to the law of value, workers rebelled and tried to organize themselves to fight the powers that be and to replace the system with a cooperative one. As the printer's union argued, we regard such an organization, a union, not only as an agent of immediate relief, but also as an essential to the ultimate destruction of those unnatural relations at present subsisting between the interests of the employee and the employed classes. When labor determines to sell itself no longer to speculators, but to become its own employer, to own and enjoy itself and the fruit thereof, the necessity for scales of prices will have passed away, and labor, uh, and labor will be forever rescued from the control of the capitalist. Little wonder, then, why wage laborers considered capitalism as a form of slavery, and why the term wage slavery became so popular in the anarchist movement. It was just reflecting the feelings of those who experienced the wage system firsthand and joined the socialist and anarchist movements. As labor historian Norman, Norman Ware notes, the term wage slave had a much better standing in the 40s of the 19th century than it has today. It was not regarded as an empty shibboleth of the soapbox orator. This would suggest that it has suffered only the normal degradation of language has become a cliche, not that it has a grossly misleading characterization. These responses of workers to the experience of wage labor is important to show that capitalism is by no means natural. The fact is that the first generation of workers tried to avoid wage labor. Is it at all possible? As, as, as they hated the restrictions of freedom it imposed upon them. They were perfectly aware that wage labor was wage slavery. That they were decidedly unfree during working hours and subjected to the will of another. While many working people now are accustomed to wage labor while also, also, uh, while also hating their job, the actual process of resistance to the development of capitalism indicates, well, it's inherently authoritarian nature. Only once other options were closed off and capitalists given an edge in the free market by state action did people accept and become accustomed to wage labor. Opposition to wage labor and factory fascism was, is widespread and seems to occur wherever it is encountered. Quote, research has shown, summarizing, uh, summarizes William Lazenek, that the freeborn Englishmen of the 18th century, even those who by force of uh, circumstance had to submit to agricultural wage labor, tenaci uh, tenaciously resisted entry into the capitalist workshop. Business Organization and the Myth of the Market Economy, page 37. British workers shared the dislike of wage labor of their American cousins. A member of the Builders Union in the 1830s argued that the trade unions, quote, will not only strike for less work and more wages, but will ultimately abolish wages, become their own masters, and work for each other. Labor and capital will no longer be separate, but will be indissolubly uh, joined together in the hands of workmen and workwomen. 
quoted by jo uh, Joffrey Ostergaard, The Tradition of Workers' Control, page 133. This is un unsurprising, for as Ostergaard notes, the workers then, who had not been swallowed up whole by the Industrial Revolution, could not make critical comparisons between the factory system and what preceded it. While wage slavery may seem natural today, the first generation of wage laborers saw the transformation of social relationships they experienced in work from a situation in which they controlled their own work, and so themselves, to one in which others controlled them. And they did not like it. However, while many modern workers instinctively hate wage labor and having bosses, without the awareness of some other method of working, many put up with it as inevitable. The first generation of wage laborers had the awareness of something else, although, of course, a flawed something else, but something else nonetheless. And this gave them a deep insight into the nature of capitalism and produced a deeply radical response to it and its authoritarian structures. Far from being a natural development, then, capitalism was imposed on a society of free and independent people by state action. Those workers alive at the time viewed it as unnatural relations and organized to overcome it. These feelings and hopes still exist and will continue to exist until such a time as we organize and abolish the wage, uh, wage system. And, well, the state supports it. I'm just going to assume the bot has not responded to my command and is the clip is processing. There it is. All right. Oh, here we go. Uh, and then 8-7. 8-7 closes out chapter 8. Um... It's a history of capitalism. Well, why is the history of capitalism important? Chapter 9 is actually kind of interesting. Is medieval Iceland an example of anarcho-capitalism working in practice? <laughs> As a great first line. Ironically, medieval Iceland is a good example of why anarcho-capitalism will not work, degenerating into de facto rule by the rich. <laughs> oh... All right. Later, Diggeth. <coughs> Take care. Come in. Yeah. They do. But, I mean, if you want to go back, like, into... Like, if you just want to do Chapter 8, like, pull up the playlist and do Chapter 8 alone, it's covered pretty effectively how capitalism was foisted um, upon the people. Yeah. So what is this? One, two, three-ish. Three and a third pages, something like that. Oh, and um, tech support. Thanks for the gift sub. Oh. Oh, and just so you know, um, the founder of fucking, like, ANCAP theory, Mur Murray Rothbard, um, believed in race science. Yeah. Yeah, he basically, um, he, he, he believed in, like, using race science to um, justify the racial disparities in income. Because under the free market system, if they continued to exist, then... Um, it has to be some intrinsic element within those people.
Yes. I think it's hilarious. All right. I'll throw that on the screen in between. In a sec. <laughs> Slavery, eugenics. What bad things does this ideology not support? Basically, basically all of them. Basically all of them. Thank you, Kyle. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is Kyle. Thank you, Kyle. 100%. Shake down. Say his name. I'm all over. I'm all over. <laughs> I'm 100% for it. I'm there for it, man. Fucking. Yeah. This is, this is, this is our right. This is our right. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Kyle. Oh. No, nah, I didn't see the coffin video. Uh, either way, I need to get back. I need to fucking stay in the groove. I need to stay in the pocket. Um, sports ball terminology. But yeah, I thought I'd bring that up too, by the way, that Rothbard believed in... Um, um, uh, Rothbard supported the presidential candidates, uh, uh, presidential campaigns of Strom Thurmond and David Duke at the end of his life, by the way. Um, Hoppe, which look, I'm not going to name names. I agree that I wouldn't call out names on fucking stream, but for those of you who are members of the community, okay, think and cap, think and cap. All right. So I'm not naming names. All right. Hoppe, who he is, he's a Hoppian. He's fucking, that's who he ascribes to is Hoppe. Hoppe explicitly supports fascism and defends the concept of an ethno state. Right? Like these are some of the worst people. Like the, the people, I knew as soon as you said Hoppe. <laughs> these are some of the worst people. All right. This is, you have to know that about ANCAPs. They are legitimately some of the worst people. Um, so yeah, yeah. Rothbard supported, um, Strom Thurmond and David Duke presidential campaigns, believed in race, a uh, race, a uh, racial sciences, um, believed in, uh, the fucking, uh, like uh, the, the use of science to, to explain the racial disparities between economic, uh, between, uh, uh, incomes within the ra uh, racial groups. Right. And then Hoppe of course was a straight up ethno statist fascist. Or is. Hoppe is still fucking kicking. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, I'm sorry. It's fucked. It's fucked. Talk about inciting some shit. Do the written. Yeah, whatever. Um, what does it say? Well, right Is that now, an R. Kelly reference on the side? No, no, because it's Robert is the R. Something K Kelly's music. I, I, I okay. So these are just names of people who have been shot, probably by. I mean, you know. Oh, we got some Nation of Islam stuff there with the, the name, though. Ooh, what's the... 
<laughs> the state police are like literally ignoring them. That's hilarious. Um, thank you, Kyle. That's all I got for that. Um, Exol. Because the slave always mirrors the master. It's sad. But yeah, it's 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 a captive mentality. It's almost Plato's cave theory at work. When all you've known is shadows. Right? Like this is the symbol of power that they're projecting. They're speaking the language of the oppressor. <laughs> yeah, Duke's still kicking. Duke's still kicking. Um, and... Um, who asked about Hoppa? Um, Hoppa. Uh, uh, Wither. H-O-P-P-A. Uh, I'm sorry. H-O-P-P-E. Hearns, uh, pff, Jesus Christ. Hans Hermann Hoppa. It's the guy's name. Um, and he's actually, like, he's, yeah, he's a, paleo, a paleo-libertarian and an anarcho-capitalist economist. And he's professor emeritus of, ec uh, professor emeritus of economics at UNLV. Yeah. He works here in town. Sounds German. Don't trust him. I wouldn't. I mean that and, you know, he unironically uh, makes explicitly fa calls to fascism um, and uh, believes in an ethno state. And uh, yes, he is German, by the way, Viva. He was born in Berlin. Maybe? No. Hang on. Um, oh, he was born in penis. Hold on. P p however you say that word. <laughs> um, so... There it is. Like, where's the fucking... Where'd it go? Um... <laughs> I love that mystic. I love that typo, Cassie. <laughs> um, oh, God damn it. I just fucking clicked that twice. All right, close. Close. There you go. <clears throat> All right. Maybe last section. Maybe second to last section. I don't know. I may try and do chapter nine, seeing as I took fucking days off last week and shit. Oh, chapter nine's long. All right. Well, let's just get this section done, and we'll see after that. <laughs> chapter eight, section seven. Why is the history of capitalism important? Simply because it provides us with an understanding of whether that system is natural and whether it can be considered just and free. If the system was created by violence, state action, and other unjust means, then the apparent freedom which we currently face within it is a fraud. A fraud masking unnecessary and harmful relations of domination, oppression, and exploitation. Moreover, by seeing how capitalist relationships were viewed by the first generation of wage slaves remind, uh, reminds us that just because many people have adjusted to this regime and consider it normal or even natural, it's nothing of the kind. Murray Rothbard is well aware of the importance of history. 
He considered the moral indignation of socialism arises from the argument that the capitalists have stolen the rightful property of the workers and therefore the existing titles to accumulated capital are unjust. He argues that given this hypothesis, the remainder of the impetus for both Marxism and anarcho-syndicalism follow, quote, logically. So, oh, by the way, that's found on Ethics of Liberty by Rothbard, page 52, Zone Admittance. So some right libertarians are aware that current property owners have benefited extensively from violence and state action in the past. Rothbard argues on page 57 of the Ethics of Liberty that if the just owners cannot be found for a property, then the property simply becomes again unowned and will belong to the first person to appropriate and utilize it. If the current owners are not the actual criminals, then there's no reason at all to dispossess them of the property. If the just owners cannot be found, then they may keep the property as the first people to use it. Of course, those who own capital and those who are using it are different people usually, but we'll ignore that obvious point. Thus, since all original owners and originally the originally dispossessed are long dead, nearly all current title owners are in just possession of their property, except for recently stolen property. The principle is simple. Dispossess the criminals, restore property to the dispossessed if they can be found, otherwise leave titles where they are. As Na Native Americans own, uh, tribes own the land collectively, this could have an interesting effect on such a policy in the U.S. Obviously, tribes that were wiped out need not apply, but would such right libertarian policies recognize such collective non-capitalist ownership claims? I doubt it, but could be wrong. The Libertarian Party Manifesto states that their just property rights be, will be restored. And who defines just, by the way? Oh, that's right. And given that unclaimed federal land will be given to Native Americans, it seems pretty likely that the original land will be left alone. Of course, this instantly gives an advantage to the wealthy on the new pure market isn't mentioned anywhere. The large corporations that, via state protection and support, built their empires and industrial base will still be in an excellent position to continue to dominate the market. Wealthy landowners benefiting from the effects of state taxation and rents caused by the land monopoly on farmstead failures will keep their property. The rich will have great initial advantage, and this may be more than enough to maintain them in their place. After all, exchanges between worker and owner tend to reinforce existing inequities, uh, inequalities, not reduce them. And as the owners can move their capital elsewhere or import new lowered wage uh, workers from across the world, it's likely to stay that way. So Rothbard's solution to the problem of past force seems to be essentially a justification of existing property titles and not a serious attempt to understand or correct passion, past initiations of force that have shaped society into a capitalist one and still shape it to today. The end result of his theory is to leave things pretty much as they are, for the past criminals are dead and so are their victims. However, what Rothbard, Rothbard fails to note is the results of the state action and coercion are still with us. He totally fails to consider that the theft of productive wealth has a greater impact on society than the theft itself. The theft of productive wealth shapes society in so many ways that all suffer from it, including current generations. This, the externalities generated by theft, cannot be easily undone by individualistic solutions. Let's take an example, somewhat more useful than the, Roth, uh, the one that Rothbard uses, namely a stolen watch. A watch can't really be used to generate wealth, although I suppose if I steal a watch, sell it, and buy a winning lottery ticket, it doesn't mean that I can keep the prize after returning the money value of your watch to you. Without the initial theft, I would not have won the prize, but obviously the prize money far exceeds the amount stolen. Is that prize money mine? Let's take a tool of production rather than a watch. Let's assume a ship sinks and 50 people get washed ashore on an island. One woman has the foresight to take a knife from the ship and falls unconscious on the, be on, on the beach. A man comes along and steals her knife. When the woman awakes, she can't remember if she managed to bring the knife ashore with her or not. The man maintains that he brought it with him, and no one else saw anything. The survivors decide to split the island equally between them and work it separately, exchanging goods via barter. However, the man with the knife now has the advantage and soon carves himself a house and fields from the wilderness. Seeing that they needed the knife and the tools created by the knife to go beyond mere existing, some of the other survivors hired themselves to the knife owner. Soon, 
he's running a surplus of goods, including houses and equipment, which he decides to hire out to others. This surplus is then used to tempt more and more of the other islanders to work for him, exchanging their land in return for the goods he provides. Soon he owns the whole island and never has to work again. His hut, well-stocked, extremely luxurious. His workers face the option of knowing his, of following his orders or being fired, i.e. expelled from the island and so back into the water in certain death. Later, he dies and leaves his knife to his son. The woman whose knife it originally was had died long before childless. Note, this example, the theft, did not involve taking any land. All had equal access to it. It was the initial theft of the knife which provided the man with the market power, an edge which allowed him to offer the others a choice between working by themselves or working for him. By working for him, they did benefit in terms of increased material wealth and also made the thief better off. But the accumulate impact of unequal exchanges turned them into effective slaves of the thief. Now, would it really be enough to turn the knife over to whoever happened to be using it once the theft was discovered? Perhaps the thief made a deathbed confession. Even if the woman who had originally taken it from the ship had been alive, would the return of the knife really make up for the years of work the survivors had put in enriching the thief or the voluntary exchanges which had resulted in the thief owning all of the island? The equipment people use, the houses they live in, and the food they eat are all the product of many hours of collective work. Does this mean that the transformation of nature, which the knife allowed to uh, remain in the hands of the descendants of the thief or become the collective property of all, would dividing it equally between all be fair? Not everyone worked equally hard to produce it. So we have a problem. The result of the initial theft is far greater than the theft considered in isolation due to the product productive nature of what was stolen. <clears throat> in other words, what Rothbard ignores in his attempt to undermine anarchist use of history is that when the property stolen is of a productive nature, the accumulative effect of its use is such as to affect all of society. Productive assets produce new property, new values, create new balance of class forces, new income, wealth inequalities, and so on. It's because of this dynamic nature of production in human life. When the theft is such that it creates accumulative effects after the initial act, it's hardly enough to say that it does not really matter anymore. If a nobleman invests in a capitalist firm with the tribute he exacted from his peasants, then, once the far firm starts doing well, sells the land to the peasants and uses that money to expand his capitalist holdings, does that really make everything all right? Does not the crime transmit with the cash? After all, the factory would not exist without the prior exploitation of the peasants. In the case of actually existing capitalism, born as it was of extensive coercive acts, the resultant of these acts have come to shape the whole society. For example, the theft of common land plus the enforcement of property rights, the land monopoly, to vast estates owned by the aristocracy ensured that working people had no option to sell their labor to the capitalists, rural or urban. The terms of these contracts reflected the weak position of the workers, and so capitalists extracted surplus value from workers and used it to consolidate their market position and economic power. Similarly, the effect of mercantilist policies and protectionism was to enrich the capitalists at the expense of workers and allow them to build industrial empires. The accumulative effect of these acts of a violation of a free market was to create a class society wherein most people consent to be wage slaves and enrich the few. While those who suffered the impositions are long gone and the results of the specific acts have multiplied and magnified well beyond their initial form. And we're still living with them. In other words, the initial acts of coercion have been transmitted and transformed by collective activity, wage labor, into society-wide effects. Rothbard argues, in the situation where the descendants or others of those who initially tilled the soil and their aggressors, or, quote, or those who purchased their claims, still exact, uh, extract tribute from the modern tillers, 
That is the case of continuing aggression against the true owners. This means that the land titles should be transferred to the peasants without compensation to the monopoly landlords. But what he fails to note is that the extracted tribute could have, not, uh, could have been used to invest in industry and transform society. Why ignore what the tribute has been used for? Does stolen property not remain stolen property after it's been transferred to another? And if the stolen property is used to create a society in which one class has to sell their liberty to another, then surely any surplus coming from those exchanges are also stolen as it was generated directly and indirectly by that theft. Yes, anarchists agree with Rothbard. Peasants should take the land they use, but which is owned by another. But this logic can equally be applied to capitalism. Workers are still living with the effects of past initiations of force, and capitalists still exact tribute from workers due to the unequal bargaining powers within the labor market that's created. The labor market, after all, was created by state action, directly or indirectly, and is maintained by state action to protect property rights and the new initiations of force by working people. The accumulative effects of stealing productive resources has been to increase the economic power of one class compared to another. As the victims of these past abuses are long gone and attempts to find their descendants meaningless because of the generalized effects of the thefts in question, anarchists feel we're justified in demanding the expropriation of the expropriators. Due to Rothbard's failure to understand the dynamic and generalizing effects that result from the theft of productive forces, i.e. externalities that occur from coercion of one person against a specific set of others, and the creation of a labor market, his attempt to refute anarchist analysis of the history of actually existing capitalism also fails. Society is the product of collective activity and should belong to all. Although whether and how we divide it up that's another question. <clears throat> Fina, oh my God, even things I've stolen were stolen. Yep. Yep. All right. Do I want to attempt chapter nine? Oh. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. Yeah, I told I told it to that that's that's right. That's it telling me uh, the recording stopped. Um that's me pushing a button and it goes I'm starting. I'm stopping. But thank you. Um it's it's not the bot saying peace out. I'm done. It's the bot telling me I'm, I'm done with that segment, segment of recording. Um, demons are bad? You got demons in your blood. Do some cocaine for it. Um, now I'm going to masturbate you. Um... I mean, look, I know it wasn't wasn't all fucking brilliant for women in the history of medicine and the history of mankind. Like, look, I get it. But there was a moment in time where you could go in and be like, you know, I'm having a rough time. And your doctor would be like, oh, that's terrible. Here, take some cocaine and heroin combined with like caffeine and like coffee and like cola and shit. And while you're while you're sipping on that fucking lean, I'm going to get a vibrator out and masturbate you. All I'm saying is, like, look, it, I've gotten a lot of medical treatments over the years. Never has a doctor offered me a hand job. I'm just saying, like, I might, I might have a different opinion of doctors if they offered me a hand job from time to time. Just saying, just saying, just saying, and some lean, right? Like, yeah, here, here, have some, have some heroin and a hand job. All right, all right, I like this doctor's office. This is a fucking, this is a full service facility. Holy shit, man. Um, <laughs> malpractice. I know, right? Like fucking, um, Glacey, I've never done heroin proper, but I've done some high test opiates like Oxycontin and stuff like that. And it's a good time. Dude, er, fucking heroin's not that addictive because it's terrible, Glazy. <laughs> it's that addictive because it's amazing. <laughs> um, uh, Yeah. 
yeah, it's like fucking, it's a hell of a time. Like, look, look, I get fucking women are being treated like dog shit, but I mean, one high high point. One high point. Like, take the win where you can get it. You can get a fucking go to your doctor's office, get some fucking lean, and, and just fucking get ru- get one rubbed out for you. It's not a terrible, it's not a terrible day. All right. Um, all right, I'm going to try chapter nine. <clears throat> Jesus Christ. No, Caboose, I'm not familiar with that one. One, one, two, three, four, five, seven pages ish. Oh. Oh. Cool caboose. Oh, yeah. No, like, how How do you... Do you guys not know the deal with Glazy? Glazy is called Libbed Cube. Uh, Lib Cubed. Sorry. Lib Cubed. Glazy is like a liberal's liberal liberal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, y'all like, oh yeah, he, he is a lib. No, he's like the definition of a liberal, y'all. Yeah. Fucking liberals wish they could be as liberal as Glazy. Yeah, we call him Lib Cubed. Um, all right. Including appropriating libertarian, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you know. Lip cubed. Um, there we go. You get a... Got gotcha. you. Beat you to it, Viva. You did the you did this the square superscript. I did the cubed. Um, that's okay, Karina. Bet the lip cubed. Um, Fourth dimensional liberal. Um, squared, cubed. What do the rest of the polynomial ones? Quartic? Am I right? Is it quartic? Would it be the, would it be the ticks? Would it then be quartic, quintic, sextic, uh, sextic? like heptic? Is that how we count the polynomials after the cubed? Does anybody know this? Fuck it. Um, if three is cubed, what is four? Ah, there's an Ask Science thread about this. There's an Ask Science thread on Reddit. If two is squared and three is cubed, what is four called and so on? The operations don't have specific names, but polynomials with the higher powers are called quartic, quintic, sextic, heptic, and octic before they stop having names. Uh, But they are not really used. 
Um, so generally it is to the fourth power. Yeah, it's fucking right. Um, it's cool room. Yeah, fucking digging that shit out of your brain, fucking that you haven't used in a while. Yeah. You're like, it's in there somewhere. I'm like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it's like, you know, sec- primary, secondary, tertiary, quadriary. Yeah. Tertiary is a good word, by the way. Tertiary is a really good word. I like the word tertiary. <clears throat> Karina's stealing it for fucking <laughs> sci fi lore. <laughs> Simplified cortex. Um, All right. This means we could get chapter nine done, and that means we'd be caught up for this week. Tangentially is a good word, Rev. Tangentially is a good word. Yeah. I I agree. It's a, it's a solid word. <laughs> Fuck, imagine modding Glazy. <laughs> uh, Glazy, you still trying to get the uh, the Floridian Empire to rise? <laughs> that is truly my favorite thing that you have ever said, Glazy. The fucking Floridian Empire is rising <laughs> to this day. It is my favorite thing you've ever said. That was the most amazing thing <laughs> ever uttered. <laughs> oh, Halcyon Days of Yore wither it's my favorite turn of phrase it's my favorite expression the halcyon days of yore especially since i suffer and i would like to go back to my halcyon days of yore for sure um not so much kirky not so much (laughs) bulbous (laughs) bulbous bulbous Bulbous. Um. America's dick will rise. Bulbous. Bulbous. Um. I know it was a kind of limp down there for a while. Watch the madness to my method. Um, Wither. Um, you and I don't have enough overlap. Cat. Cat definitely. Like, I mean, Cat has been called Baby Kai since before Twitch. Cat 100%. Like, the, the Matrix lines up on Cat and I. It gets weird sometimes for Cat and I. You and I don't have enough overlap. Um, but, you know, I like to... You're all my children in a way. <laughs> I may not I may not have children, but in a way, you're all my children. <sighs> um <laughs> You're you're my legacy. Go forth. Um <laughs> this is terrifying. Are we in a cult? School room. Didn't you notice the sign on the door? Hell yeah, you're in a cult. Um Fucking dude, it'd be great. Fucking run a cult that everybody knows is a cult, right? Like, wouldn't that be the greatest cult, right? Like, are you? I think you guys might be in a cult. Well, yeah, of course. Wait, wait, wait you know? Oh, fuck yeah! I mean, we're not doing the shit on the DL. <laughs> we all know what's up. <laughs> Oh, he pops. Can I borrow 50 bucks? Daddy, can we play with the end caps next door? (laughs) Um, 
Hi, I'm in a cult. Want to join? Right? I'd rather be a cultor than a cultee. Uh, cult time with the homies. Oh, interesting, Kamian. Yeah, I don't, I don't allow uh, unbans. Um, I purge, I, I don't do unban requests. I purge bans after about a year or so, um, but I don't allow unban requests. Yeah, that's, that's how we run it um, on, uh, on this channel, at least. It's like no unban requests, but eventually the, the, the bans fall off. Uh, dude, how are we going to get tax deductions? Bitch, we're a legal church. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> I love you. I really do kind of. Glazy, you irritate the fuck out of me sometimes, but legitimately, you're like a 50, you're like a coin flip, Glazy. You're like a coin flip. You're, you're either going to irritate me or you're going to say something that's going to make me chuckle or just outright laugh. Um, so <laughs> it's, Hey, that's, that's a better fucking hit rate than most of society. Like legitimately <laughs> you're doing better than most people, Glazy. So fuck. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I still, the Floridian empire is rising. The Floridian empire is rising. <laughs> still my favorite thing to this day. Oh, bet the lib cubed. Oh, uh, all right. <clears throat> this is going to take a minute. <laughs> Call me in. Um, this is going to take a minute. This is like seven pages. Oh God. There's a phrase I haven't seen in a minute. Buddhist, I, I probably will never do that. All right. <clears throat> Bear with me. Blanca? <laughs> is, he, is Glazy Blanca? Um, I don't know how to say this fucking name. How do I say this? I need to check this first. Does anybody speak Icelandic? Friends uh, and greetings from Iceland. This footage is from three days ago and it's from the mid Atlantic Rift Valley, call it Think Vatler or Parliament Valleys. In the previous footage, you saw the video of American tectonic plate, and now we go to the other side where uh, you can observe rifting, ongoing rifting, divergence as well. And for centuries, well, for a long time, it was believed that this is the Eurasian tectonic plate. Every guide will tell you that what you are seeing here is Eurasian tectonic plate, which is diverging from American tectonic plate. The reality is somewhat different. However, 15 years ago, it had been discovered the existence of Icelandic micro plate or Icelandic tectonic plate. Which is very small. God damn it, say the word. I found one video using this fucking Icelandic word. <laughs> it's like, fucking say the word, asshole. Some hundred by hundred square kilometers. And, and it had been named Hreppa. 
So precisely Crepa. here. Crepa. All right. Cool. It's pretty much pronounced how it's spelled. Good to know. Um. Crepa. <laughs> All right, let's try and get this shit done. If we can get chapter nine done, then we only have 10, 10, one, 10, two, 10, three. Uh, what do we have? Uh, if we get chapter nine done, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 11 sections after that. The only Icelandic word pronounced is it's spelled. I know, right? Um, mm. Chapter nine, is medieval Iceland an example of anarcho-capitalism working in practice? Ironically, medieval Iceland is a good example of why so-called anarcho-capitalism will not work, degenerating into de facto rule by the rich. It should be pointed out that first, uh, first that Iceland nearly a thousand years ago was not a capitalistic system. In fact, like most cultures claimed by so-called anarcho-capitalists as examples of their utopia, it was communal, not individualistic. Society was based on artists and production with extensive communal institutions as well as individual ownership, i.e. use, and a form of social self-administration. The thing, both local and Iceland-wide, which can be considered a primitive form of the anarchist communal assembly. As William Ian Miller points out, people of a communitarian nature have reason to be attracted to medieval Iceland, the limited role of lordship, the active participation of large numbers of free people in decision-making within and without the homestead. The economy barely knew the existence of markets. Social relations preceded economic relations. The nexus of household, kin, thing, even enmity, enmity and more, the, uh, more than the nexus of cash bound people to each other. The lack of extensive economic differentiations supported a weakly differentiated class system, and material deprivations were more evenly distributed than they would um, be once state institutions also had to be maintained. Blood taking and peacemaking, feud law and society in Saga, Iceland, page 306. At this time, Iceland, quote, remained entirely rural. There were no towns, not even villages, and early Iceland participated only marginally in the active trade of Viking Age Scandinavia. There was, uh, there was a diminished level of stratification which emerged from the first phase of social and economic development, lent an appearance of egalitarianism. Social stratification was restrained and political, political hierarchy limited. Jesse Bjork, uh, Viking Age Iceland, page two. That such a society could be classed as capitalist or even considered a model for an advanced industrial society is, well, staggering. Kropotkin in Mutual Aid indicates that Norse society from which the settlers in Iceland came had various mutual aid institutions, including mutual, uh, communal land ownership based around what he called the village community. And the thing, see also Kropotkin's The State, its historic role for discussion of the village community, it, it's reasonable to think that the first settlers in Iceland would have bought uh, would have brought such institutions with them, and that Iceland did indeed have its equivalent of the commune or village community, the hreppar, which developed early in the country's history. Like the early local assemblies, it was not so much discussed in the sagas, but is mentioned in the law book, a word I can't even begin to pronounce. It was composed of a minimum of 20 farms and had a five-member commission. The hreppar was self-governing, among other things, and responsible for seeing that orphans and the poor within the area were fed and housed. Repar also served as a property insurance agency and assisted in case of fire and losses due to diseased livestock. In addition, as in most cap pre-capitalist societies, there were commons, common land available for use by all. During the summer, common lands and pastures in the highland, often called almening, were used by the region's farmers for grazing. This increased the dependence of the population from uh, this increased the independence of the population from the wealthy, as these public lands offered opportunities for enterprising individuals to increase their store provisions and to find saleable merchandise. 
the merchandise. <coughs> Thus, Icelandic society had a network of solidarity based upon communal life. This, quote, the status of farmers as free agents was reinforced by the presence of communal units called hrepar. These were geographically defined associations of landowners. The hrepar were go self-governing and guided by a five-member steering committee. As early as the 900s, the whole country seemed to have divided into hrepar. The hrepar provided a blanket of local security, allowing the land-owning farmers a measure of independence to partic participate in the choices of political life. Through cooperation among their members, Hrepa organized and controlled summer grazing lands, organized communal labor, provided an immediate local forum for settling disputes. Crucially, they provided fire and livestock insurance for local farmers. They also saw to the feeding and housing of local orphans and administered poor relief to people who were recognized as inhabitants of their area. People who could not provide for themselves were assigned to member farms, which took turns in providing for them. In practice, this meant that each commune was a mutual insurance company, or at least a miniature welfare state of sorts. And membership in the commune was not voluntary. Each farmer had to belong to the commune in which his farm was located and to contribute to its needs. Um, ordered Anarchy State and Rent-Seeking, the Icelandic Commonwealth, 930-1262, by Solvason and... Uh, Gurararson? Oof, rough, brutal. The Icelandic Commonwealth did not allow farmers not to join its communes, and once attached to the local repar, a, a farm's affiliation could not be changed. However, they did play a key role in keeping the society free, as the repar was essentially non political and addressed subsistence and economic security needs. Its presence freed farmers from depending on an overclass to provide comparable services or corresponding security measures. Therefore, the Icelandic Commonwealth can hardly be claimed in any significant way as an example of so-called anarcho-capitalism in practice. This can also be seen from the early economy, where prices were subject to popular judgment at the skuldaping, uh, payment thing, not supply and demand. Um, Kirsten Hastrup, uh, Culture and History in Medieval Iceland, page 125. Indeed, with its communal price-setting system in local assemblies, the early Icelandic Commonwealth was more similar to a guild socialism, which was based upon guildings, uh, guilds negotiating just prices for goods and services rather than capitalism. Therefore, Miller correctly argues that it would be wrong to impose capitalist ideas and assumptions onto an Icelandic society. Inevitably, the attempt was made to add early Iceland to the number of regions that socialized people in nuclear families within simple households. What the sources tell us about the shape of Icelandic householding must compel a different conclusion. In other words, Kropokin's analysis of communal society is far closer to the reality of medieval Iceland than so-called anarcho-capitalist attempt to turn it into some kind of capitalist utopia. However... The communal nature of Icelandic society also coexisted, as in most, other, uh, as in most uh, such cultures, with hierarchical institutions, including some with capitalistic elements, namely private property and private states, around the local Goldar. Uh, Goldar. The Goldar were local chiefs, who also took the role of religious leaders. As even the Encyclopedia Britannica can explain to you, it was the Goldar was a kind of local government which uh, which evolved in Iceland, by which the people of a district who had the most dealings together formed groups under the leadership of the most important or influential man in the district, the Godi. The Godi acted as a judge and mediator and took a lead in communal activities, such as building places of worship. These local assemblies are heard of before the establishment of the Althing, the national thing. <clears throat> the South thing led to cooperation between the local assemblies. Thus, Icelandic society had different elements, one based on local chiefs and communal organizations. Society was marked by inequalities, as among the land there were differences in wealth and prominence. Distinct cleavages existed between landovers and landless people and between free men and slaves. This meant that it was marked by aspects of statelessness and egalitarianism, as well as elements of social hierarchy. Although Iceland was not a democratic system, proto-democratic tendencies did exist. The Icelandic social system was designed to reduce the power of the wealthy by enhancing communal institutions, though. Quote, 
The society was based on a system of decentralized self-government. The Viking Age settlers began by establishing local things, or assemblies, which had been the major forum for, meet, uh, for meetings of freemen and aristocrats in the old Scandinavian and Germanic social orders. They, the Icelanders, excluded overlords with coercive power and expended the mandate, uh, extended the mandate of the assembly to, f- uh, to fill the full spectrum of the interests of the landed free farmers. The changes transformed a Scandinavian decision-making body that mediated between freemen and overlords into an Icelandic self-contained governmental system without overlords. At the core of Icelandic government was the all thing, a national assembly of freemen. Therefore, we see communal self-management in a basic form, plus cooperation between communities as well. These uh, these communistic uh, mutual aid features exist in many non-capitalistic cultures and are often essential for ensuring people's continued freedom within those cultures. Usually, the existence of private property, and so inequality, soon led to the destruction of communal forms of self-management, with participation by all male members of the community as in Iceland, which are then replaced by the rule of the rich. While such developments are a commonplace in most primitive cultures, the Icelandic case has an unusual feature which explains the interest it provokes in so-called anarcho-capitalist circles. This feature was that individuals could seek protection from any godi. The extent of the godord, the chieftaincy, was not fixed by territorial boundaries. Those who were dissatisfied with their chief could attach to another godi. As a result, rivalry uh, arose between the godar, the chiefs, as may be seen from the Icelandic sagas. This was because while there, were, uh, there, were a se- there was a central legislature and uniform countrywide judicial and legal systems, people would seek the protection of any godi, providing payment in return. These godi, in effect, would be subject to market forces, as, dis- as dissatisfied individuals could then affiliate themselves with another godi. This system, however, has an obvious and, well, fatal flaw. The position of the godi could be bought and sold, as well as inherited. Consequently, with the passing of time, the goldard, for large areas of the country, became concentrated in the hands of one man, or a few men. This was the principal weakness of the old form of their government. It led to a struggle of power, and was the chief reason for the ending of the Commonwealth and for the country's submission to the King of Norway. It was the existence of these hierarchical elements in Icelandic society that explain its fall from anarchistic to statist society. As Kropotkin argued, from chieftainship sprang, on the one hand, the state, and on the other hand, private property. Act for yourselves, page 85. Kropotkin's insight that chieftainship is the transitional system has been confirmed by anthropologists studying primitive societies. They've come to the conclusion that societies made up of chieftainships or chiefdoms are not states. Chiefdoms are neither stateless nor state societies in the fullest sense of either term. They are on the borderline between the two. Having emerged out of the stateless system, they give the impression of being on their way to centralized states and exhibit characteristics of both. Since the Commonwealth was made up of chieftains, this explains the contradictory nature of the society. It was in the process of transition from anarchy to statism, from communal economy to one based on private property. The political transition within Icelandic society went hand-in-hand with an economic transition, both tendencies being mutually reinforcing. Initially, when Iceland was settled, large-scale farming based on extended households with kinsmen was the dominant economic uh, mode. This semi-communal mode of production changed as the lands was divided up, mostly through inheritance claims between the 10th and 11th centuries. This new economic system based upon individual possession and artisan production was then slowly displaced by tenant farming, in which the farmer worked for the landlord, starting in the late 11th century. This economic system based on tenant farming, i.e. capitalistic production, ensured that great variants of property and power emerged. Kirsten Hastrup, Culture and History of Medieval Iceland, pages 172 to 173. So... Significant changes in society started to occur in the 11th century. As slavery all but ceased, tenant farming took its place. Iceland was moving from an economy based on possession to one based on private property. 
And so the renting of land was widely established practice by the late 11th century. The status of the godar must have been connected with land ownership and rents. This led to increasing oligarchy. And so the mid to late 12th century was then characterized by the appearance of a new elite, the big chieftains, who were called the Storgodar, who uh, struggled from the 1220s to the 1260s to win what had earlier been unattainable for Icelandic leaders, the prize of overlordship or centralized executive authority. During this evolution in ownership patterns and the concentration of wealth and power into a few hands, should note that the Godis and wealth, uh, wealthy landowners' attitude to profit-making also changed. With market values starting to replace those associated with honor, kin, and so on, social relations became replaced by economic relations and the nexus of household. Kin and thing was replaced by the nexus of cash and profit. The rise of capitalistic social relationships in production and values within society also reflected in exchange with the local marketplace, with its pricing subject to popular judgment being subsumed under central markets. With a form of wage labor, tenant farming, being dominant within society, it's not surprising that great differences in wealth started to appear. Also, as protection did not come free, it's not surprising that a godi tended to be, uh, become rich. Also, in Kropokin's word, the individual accumulation of wealth and power. Powerful godi would be useful for wealthy landowners when disputes over land and rent appeared. A wealthy landowners would be useful for a godi looking for income. Concentrations of wealth, in other words, produce, con uh, produce concentrations of social uh, concentrations of wealth produce concentrations of social and political power and vice versa. Power always follows wealth. Kropokin, Mutual Aid 131. The transformation of possession into property and the resulting rise of hired labor was a key element in the accumulation of wealth and power and the corresponding decline in liberty amongst those farmers. Moreover, with hired labor springs dependency. The worker is now dependent on good relations with their landlord in order to have access to the land they need. With such reductions in the independence of part of Icelandic society, the, un <laughs> the undermining of self-management and the various things was also likely as laborers could not vote freely as they could be subject to sanctions from their landlord for voting the wrong way. Quote, the courts were less likely to base judgments on the evidence than to adjust decisions to satisfy the honor and resources of power uh, powerful individuals. Thus, hierarchy within the economy then spreads to the rest of society, and in particular, social institutions reinforcing the effects of the accumulation of wealth and power. <coughs> the resulting classification of Icelandic society played a key role in its move from relative equality and anarchy to a class society and statism. As Miller points out, <clears throat> As long as the social organization of the economy did not allow for people to maintain retinues, the basic egalitarian assumptions of the honor system were reflected reasonably well in reality. The mentality of hierarchy never fully extricated itself from the egal egalitarian ethos of a frontier society created and recreated by juridi uh, juridi juridicially equal far uh, farmers. Much of the egalitarian ethic maintained itself even though it accorded less and less with economic realities. By the end of the Commonwealth period, certain assumptions about class privilege and expectations of deference were already well established to have become part of the lexicon of self-congratulation and self-justification. This process in turn accelerated the destruction of communal life and the emergence of statism focused around the Godord. In effect, the Godi and the wealthy farmers became rulers of the country. Political changes simply reflected economic changes from a communalistic, anarchistic society to a statist, proprietarian one. Ironically, this process was a natural aspect of the system of competing chiefs recommended by so-called anarcho-capitalists. In the 12th and 13th century, Icelandic society experienced changes in the balance of power. As part of the evolution to a more stratified social order, the number of chief uh, chieftains diminished and the power of the remaining leaders grew. By the 13th century, six large families had come to monopolize the control and uh, ownership of many of the original chieftaincies. These families were called Storg uh, Storgodard, and they uh, gained control over whole regions. 
This process was not imposed as the rise in social complexity was evolutionary rather than revolutionary. They simply moved up the ladder. This political change reflected economic processes. For at the same time, other social transformations were at work in conjunction with the development of the Stolgadar elite, the most successful among the uh, Bendir, the farmers, also moved up a rung on the social ladder, being big farmers or st uh, Storbadir, Bendir. Um, unsurprisingly, it was the rich farmers who initiated the final step towards statism. And by the 1250s, the Stor Bender, Bender and their followers had grown weary of the Stor Godar and their quarrels. In the end, it was they who accepted the king of Norway's offer to become part of his kingdom. The obvious conclusion is that as long as Iceland, uh, Iceland was not capitalistic, it was anarchic, and as it became more capitalistic, it became more statist. This process within, wherein the concentration of wealth leads to the destruction of communal life, and so the anarchistic aspects of a given society can be seen elsewhere. For example, in the history of the United States after the Revolution, or in the degeneration of the free cities of medieval Europe. <clears throat> Peter Kropokin, in his classic work, Mutual Aid, documents this process in some detail, in many cultures and in time periods. However, that this process occurred in a society which is used by so-called anarcho-capitalists is an example of their system in action, reinforces the anarchistic analysis of the status nature of anarcho so-called anarcho-capitalism and the deep flaws in its theories, as was discussed in section 6 of this chapter. As Miller argues, it is not the have-nots, after all, who invented the state. The first steps towards state formation in Iceland were made by churchmen and by the big men content with imitating Norwegian royal state. Early state formations, I would guess, tend to involve the redistributions not from rich to poor, but from poor to rich, from weak to strong. The so-called anarcho-capitalist argument that Iceland was an example of their ideology working in practice is derived from the work of David Friedman. Friedman is less gung-ho than many of his followers, arguing in The Machinery of Freedom that Iceland only had some features of a so-called anarcho-capitalist society and that provides some evidence in support of his ideology. How a pre-capitalist society can provide any evidence to support an ideology aimed at an advanced industrial and urban economy, well, that's hard to say as the institutions that society cannot be artificially separated from its social base. But ironically, though, it does present some evidence against so-called anarcho-capitalism precisely because of the rise of capitalist element within it. Friedman is aware of how the Icelandic Republic degenerated and its causes. He states in a footnote in his 1979 essay, Private Creation and Enforcement of Law, a Historical Case, that, quote, the question of why the system eventually broke down is both interesting and difficult. I believe that two of the proximate causes were increased concentration of wealth, and hence power, and the introduction into Iceland of a foreign ideology, kingship. The former meant that in many, in many areas, all or most of the Kador were held by one family, and the latter that by the end of the Sturlung period, the chieftains were no longer fighting over the traditional quarrels of who owned what to whom, but over who should eventually rule Iceland. The ultimate reasons for these changes are beyond the scope of this paper. However, from an anarchist point of view, the foreign ideology of king, uh, kingship would be the product of changing socioeconomic conditions that were expressed in the increasing concentration of wealth and not its cause. After all, the settlers of Iceland were well aware of the ideology of kingship for the 300 years during which the republic existed. As Bjork notes, Iceland inherited the tradition and the vocabulary of statehood from its European origins. On the mainland, kings were enlarging their authority at the expense of the traditional rights of free farmers. The immigrants to Iceland were well aware of this process. Available ev evidence does suggest that early Icelanders knew quite well what they did not want. In particular, they were collectively opposed to the centralizing aspect of a state. Unless some kind of collective and cultural amnesia occurred, the notion of a foreign ideology causing the degeneration is, well, hard to accept. Moreover, only the concentration of wealth allowed would be kings the opportunity to develop an act and the creation of boss worker social relationships on the land made the poor subject to and familiar with the concept of authority. 
Such familiarity would spread into all aspects of life, combined with the existence of prosperous and so powerful Godi to enforce the appropriate servile responses, ensured the end of a relative equality that fostered Iceland's, uh, Iceland's anarchistic tendencies in the first place. In addition, as private property is a monopoly of rulership over a given area, the conflict between chieftains for power was, at its most basic, a conflict of who would own Iceland and so rule it. <coughs> the attempt to ignore the facts that private property creates rulership, i.e. a monopoly of government over a given area, and that monarchies are privately owned states, does Friedman's case no good. In other words, a system of private property that has a built-in tendency to produce both the ide ideology and fact of kingship, the power structures implied by kingship, are reflected in the social relations which are produced by private property. Friedman is also aware that an objection to his system is that the rich or powerful could commit crimes with impunity since nobody would be able to enforce judgment against them. Where power is sufficiently concentrated, this might be true. This is one of the problems which led to the eventual breakdown of the Icelandic legal system in the 13th century. But so long as power was reasonably dispersed, as it seems to have been for the first two centuries after the system was established, it's a less of a serious problem. Which is quite ironic. Firstly, because the first two centuries of Icelandic society was marked by non-capitalist economic relations, communal pricing, family and individual possession of land. Only when capitalistic social relations developed, hired labor, property replacing possession, market values replacing social values. In the 12th century, did power begin to be con become concentrated, leading then to the breakdown of the system in the 13th century. Secondly, because Friedman's claiming that so-called anarcho-capitalism will work if there's an approximate equality within society. But this state of affairs is one a most so-called anarcho-capitalist claim is impossible and undesirable. They claim there will always be rich and poor, but inequality in wealth will also become inequality of power. When actually existing capitalism has become more free market, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Apparently, according to so-called anarcho-capitalists, in an even purer capitalism, this process will somehow magically be reversed. It's ironic that an ideology that denounces egalitarianism as a revolt against nature implicitly requires an egalitarian society in order to work. In reality, wealth concentration is a fact of life in any system based upon hierarchy and private property. Friedman is aware why so-called anarcho-capitalism will become ruled by the rich, but prefers to believe that pure capitalism will produce an egalitarian society. In the case of the Commonwealth of Iceland, well, this didn't happen. The rise of private property was accompanied by a rise in inequality, and this led to the breakdown of the republic into statism. In short... Medieval Iceland nicely illustrates David Wick's comments as uh, quoted in chapter 6, section 3, that when private wealth is uncontrolled, then a police judicial complex enjoying a clientele of wealthy corporations whose motto is self-interest is hardly an innocuous social force controllable by the po uh, possibility of forming or affiliating with competing companies. That is to say that free market justice soon results in rule for the rich. And being able to affiliate with competing defense companies will be insufficient to stop or change that process. This is simply because any defense judicial system does not exist in a social vacuum. The concentration of wealth, a natural process under the free market, particularly one marked by private property and wage labor, has an impact on the surrounding society. Private property, i.e. monopolization of the means of production, allows monopolists to begin, become a ruling elite by exploiting and so accumulating vastly more wealth than, well, the workers. This elite then uses its wealth to control the coercive mechanisms of society, military, police, private security forces, call it what you will, which it employs to protect its monopoly and thus its ability to accumulate ever more wealth and power. Thus, private property far from increasing the freedom of the individual, has always been the necessary precondition for the rise of the state and rule by the rich. Medieval Iceland 
It's just a classic example of this process at work. <clears throat> so just short of a half an hour on that one. <laughs> somebody tagged me. I know somebody was talking at me. Do you ever feel happy about doing something DC even though you're fully aware it doesn't matter? <laughs> oh, yeah, zero. It's a good dopamine hit. I mean, what do you think this shit is? <laughs> um, dare I do the first part of section 10? Yeah, I'm not doing 10 1. 10 1's long. Oh, 10 1's long. 10 1 is long. Holy shit. But chapter 10, like 10 0 is short. It's like one page. I could bang that out. <clears throat> they are, Corey. Um, they're highly fucking um atheist. Yeah, they're they're not big into that. The Nordic countries in general are very atheistic. <clears throat> Yeah, ten one. I'm not doing. I'm gonna do ten zero though. I think with her, dude. Yeah, seriously. Like here, this is. Wait, hang on. Me. All right. This is ten one. There. <laughs> yeah, ten one is long. Uh, no tech support I'm doing the section each section gets its own <clears throat> um, and then um, but yeah each, each section gets its own video that's how I've been doing it deck Like a good, like a good free will. Just thank you, shrimps. <clears throat> um, all right, <laughs> crimson, crimson. I, 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 as somebody who has spent a fair amount of time in bathtubs trying to just take a break from his body. Um, I actually kind of really love that you're fucking chilling in the bath listening. No, Zippy. I try and, I try and keep these as... Um, straight laced as possible. Um, they are to be a, <sighs> I have done a bedtime story once. Like I've, I've read you guys a bedtime story once I did, uh, go the fuck to sleep <laughs> or go the fuck to bed or whatever the, is it go the fuck to sleep or go the fuck to bed, go the fuck to sleep. Yeah. It's go the fuck to sleep. I've read, I've read go the fuck to sleep before, uh, an inflatable hot tub. Oh, Jesus, YouTube's updating their fucking terms of services again. Um, oh, they're finally including what constitutes a community strike, a community guideline strike. Fucking about time. No one knows what the fuck it actually meant. Oh, fucking Corey. I don't give a shit. I dude don't care. Um, 
<laughs> of course, I'm in the bath. <laughs> nice crimson after. Yeah, pulling two all-nighters like that. Um, yeah, we have. We've joked about the inflatable pool in a one-piece Victorian-style bathing suit. Um, there they are. Community guidelines. Jesus Christ. If anybody wants it here, so you know what the fuck we deal with. Basically everything in this. Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh. They're so fucking sensory these days. They're so sensory. Rumble, yeah. Yeah, I'd imagine. Have you, Rumble, have you considered doing the cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot thing? Like ice bath to hot bath to ice bath to hot bath. Okay, so I we got the community strike from misinformation policy. It doesn't fit their description. Oh, it doesn't fit their description. How dare they? Assholes. <laughs> Got your second Fauci. Uh, Fauci Ouchie. Oh. Uh. Yeah, beastical. Yeah, you get the you get the pop up poll on that one. Yeah. Hmm, interesting tech support. This is probably a worthwhile insight young hazard 98 thank you for the follow sorry the alert didn't pop up but i'm doing some readings and some recordings so i've got them turned off right now tyranny of the tos yes all right <clears throat> last one i promise but i took like two days off last week i took two days off last week and got behind. I didn't do any of the readings. And so I'm just trying to catch up here. So bear with me. This one is like one page. This one's one page. So <clears throat> it's not a big deal. You know what? Tech support, that is the that is the closest argument. That is the only argument anybody's ever managed to to like make that's gotten me in my mind close to considering TikTok. Like, oh, okay. I get it. All right. Like that 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 seems I I, I get that. I get that. I could um Yeah, well, whether I meant to drop like 30 of them. <laughs> Uh, slowly whittled them down. Uh, but yeah, tech support, that's actually a solid argument for TikTok's existence. I mean, there's still Chinese spyware, but yeah, <clears throat> I get it at least. I get it, man. Um, All right.
Chapter 10, Section 0. Would laissez-faire capitalism be stable? Unsurprisingly, right libertarians combine their support for absolute property rights with a wholehearted support for laissez-faire capitalism. In such a system, which they maintain to quote Ayn Rand, is an unknown ideal. Everything would be private property, and there would be few, if any, restrictions on voluntary exchanges. So-called anarcho-capitalists are the most extreme defenders of pure capitalism, urging that the state itself will be privatized and no voluntary exchange made illegal. For example... Children would be considered property of their parents, and it would be morally right to turn them into child prostitutes. Child has the option of leaving home if they object. There have been no examples of pure capitalism. It's difficult to say whether their claims about it are true. For a discussion of a close approximation, see section three of this chapter. But this section is an attempt to discover whether such a system would be stable or whether it would subject itself to the usual booms and busts. Before starting, we should note that there is some disagreement within the right libertarian camp itself on this subject, although instead of stability, they usually refer to it as equilibrium, which is an economics term meaning that all of the society's resources are fully utilized. In general terms, most right libertarians reject this, the concept of equilibrium as such and instead stress that the economy is inherently a dynamic. This is one of the key aspects of the Austrian school after all. Such a position is correct, of course, as noted by socialists such as Karl Marx and uh, 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 Mikhail Kalecki and capitalist economists, uh, economists such as Keynes wrong, uh, recognized long ago. But there seems to be two main schools of thought on the nature of disequilibrium. One, inspired by von, Ma uh, von Mises, maintains that the actions of the entrepreneur slash capitalist result in the market coordinating supply and demand. And another, inspired by Joseph Schumpeter, the sane one, who questions whether markets coordinate because entrepreneurs are constantly innovating and creating new markets, products, and techniques. Of course, both actions happen, and we suspect that the differences in the two approaches are not important. The important thing to remember is that so-called anarcho-capitalists and right libertarians in general re reject the notion of equilibrium, but when discussing their utopia, they actually indicate this. For example, most so-called anarcho-capitalists will maintain that the existence of government and or unions causes him unemployment by either stopping capitalists investing in new lines of industry or forcing up the price of labor above its market clearing level or perhaps restricting, immig restricting immigration, minimum wages, taxing profits. Thus, we assured that the worker will be better off in a pure capitalism because of the unprecedented demand for labor it will create. However, Full employment of labor is an equilibrium in economic terms and that that, remember, is impossible due to the dynamic nature of the system. When pressed, they'll usually admit that there will be periods of unemployment as the market adjusts or that full unemployment actually means under a certain percentage of unemployment. Thus, if you rightly reject the notion of equilibrium, you also reject the idea of full, uh, uh, full employment and so the labor market becomes a buyer's market and the labor is at a massive, dis massive disadvantage once again. The right libertarian case is based upon logical deduction and the premises, uh, the, the premises required to show that laissez-faire capitalism will be stable are, well, somewhat incredible. If banks do not set the wrong interest rate, if companies do not extend too much trade credit, if workers are willing to accept real wage-related pay cuts, if workers altruistically do not abuse their market power in a fully employed society, if interest rates provide the correct information, if capitalists predict the future relatively well, if banks and companies do not suffer from isolation paradoxes, then, then, maybe, laissez-faire will be stable. So, will laissez-faire capitalism be stable? Well, let's start by analyzing the assumptions of right libertarianism, namely that there will be full, unemploy uh, full employment and that a system of private banks will stop the business cycle. We'll start on the banking system first, see section one, followed by the effects of the labor market on economic stability, see section two, then we'll indicate using the example of a 19th century America that actually existing impure laissez-faire uh, was very unstable. Explaining booms and busts by state action plays an ideological convenience as it exonerates market processes as the source of instability within capitalism. 
what we help to do uh, or indicate in the next two sections is why the business cycle is inherent in the system. Bam. Oh. All right, let me. Uh, Crimson, yeah, you have to you have to unlock them. Basically, there's a process to get a hold of them. Um, oh, which what copyright claim happened on that one? <laughs> Hilarious. Um, Log in. Clips. Clip management. There we go. All right. Let's turn alerts back on before I forget. Let's turn the music on so we have some background noise. Um, let's see. Read alerts. God, I hate that all the alerts are fucking separated. Um... Well, and now let's finish the workflow and get this shit uploaded to YouTube. Um, eight, four, eight, four. Nope. Where's 8.4 on the list? There's 8.4. Okay. 8.7. Thanks for the follow, whoever that was. Oh, no, it was a Zippy. Sorry, I just uh, heard the Mother Anarchy. Zippy, thank you for the resub. It does go ding ding. Um, point, Yeah, that was 8.5, 8.6, 8.7. 9.5. Ten. Cool. Get those downloaded and uploaded. Um, wrong one. There we go. Right one. Nice, Jay. Um. And if you want, the document is attached um, to every description. Like every section that we're discussing, Jay, is in the description of the YouTube video. So you can go to the document and read along in the section, right? If you're, you know, if, you, if you're one of, I'm one of those people, right? Like if I'm listening to somebody do an audio portion of like learning something, I like the text guide to be able to follow along. It just reinforces things, right? So, yeah, if, if ever you're doing the ANCAP playlist um, and you want to follow along, check the description, the section that that one, it will be linked in the description. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. All right, cool. That's done. Let's upload these videos. And craps. Ten. Yeah. All right. Ha <laughs> ha. 
I'm going to say it. I'm an out-of-touch old dude. Read with my own eyes? Fair enough. Okay. Thus begins the titling work portion of this workflow. Where's notepad? There's notepad. Eight five. Playlists. Show more. Recording date. Publish. Apparently honk. Uh, it's six. I will be so happy to have this done. I will be so fucking happy. We're getting, we're getting there. We're getting close, folks. We're getting close. We're, we're within striking distance now, right? Three sections of 10 and then seven sections of 11. We're, we're 10 sections away and then we're done with this fucking playlist. I think that's for you to decide tech support. Um, that's eight, seven, right? Yeah, that's eight, seven. Eight, seven. Uh, nope. Publish. Autonomous honk communitarian honk commune. Um, <coughs> close that one. Nine is titled. Yes, nine. Oh, and whoever mentioned that um, the the AC fucking uh, the Assassin's Creed Iceland one, fucking they didn't seem to cover any of this in Assassin's Creed. I think that was Rev. Um, yeah, imagine that a historically inaccurate Ubisoft game. Mm. Shocking. Next, you're going to tell me ancient aliens didn't help construct uh, fucking Egypt. Wait, did I do that wrong? Yeah, I did. All right. That's nine. All right. Where is where's the Iceland one? Um, they were illegal aliens. Um, Rev, I use, like, if I play those games, which is rare, I, I don't, dude, I, I, I dumped out. Yeah, Kaiser, it'll do that. Um, I dumped out of the fucking AC series. Like, I played, I have played all of the Assassin's Creed games up to, what was the one before Iceland? Was that... 
Odyssey? Origins, then Odyssey, right? I've played up through Odyssey. And I do not consider basically everything after... Um... Oh god, the name is escaping me. Which one was the... It wasn't great, but... Um, Industrial England, the brother and sister pair. Um... that one everything after that is basically not even a assassin Cre assassin's creed game but dishonored no um it's not even an rpg but um This is going to drive me insane. Syndicate. Syndicate. Everything after Syndicate doesn't isn't even like an Assassin's Creed game. And Unity and Syndicate were sort of the end. <coughs> yeah. Um, as far as I'm concerned, Origins, Odyssey, and Valhalla can go fuck themselves. Uh, Syndicate was Syndicate was good. It, Syndicate was the best engine. Syndicate was an amazing engine, um, but the storyline was kind of not great um but if you want an amazing looking like an amazing playing um assassin's creed game syndicate's great um but the story is sort of uh, ham-fisted shall we say And close that, close that, and and last one on the playlist. Yeshiri. <laughs> Next is publish. There we go. Cool. Uh, favorite AC game. Um. Two. Two. Yeah. I just wanted to verify something for myself. Um, yeah. I mean, not, not the best playing. Um, but as far as like Assassin Creed, Assassin's Creed games go, yeah, two. Um, the the assassination of um, Pope Rodrigo, right? Um, that's I agree. Like, let's go kill a pope, right? Like, that's that was fucking dude. That was a mission. That was a fucking mission, right? Like now it's all fucking bullshit. Like I'm sorry. Like I'm sorry, but yeah, once upon a time that game series was fucking tight as shit, man. Um, but yeah, now it's all grindy fucking XP fucking bullshit. I'm sorry. Like the, the new systems suck. The new systems suck. The storytelling sucks. They're just dragging the series out so that they can get another iteration. 
they're just like, we need another one because we make millions of dollars. So fucking don't conclude any story. Don't wrap anything up actually. Fucking always leave a teaser or a hanger or fucking don't answer the questions that we've been asking for five, 12 fucking games, right? Like just leave all of that open so that we can crank out another one of these pieces of fucking Ubisoft shit because every Ubisoft open world game is exactly the same game. Right? Like, they just reskin their games. They're like, this one's Viking, Assassin Viking themed. This one's hacker themed. This one's fucking, that fucking Ubisoft games are all the same. Fuck them. Let's see. Rev true problem is I kind of like that game. See, I understand. Yeah, the Ezio arc is um I understand the attraction to that game and I understand the like like you know, okay. <clears throat> like when when the theme version of that game releases you you fucking, you know, you get in. But they're all wither. But the hacker games have a good story. The hacker games have the exact same story as Assassin's Creed. Here's the thing. They take place in the exact same world. This is confirmed in the real world playing portion of Black Flag. When you're playing Black Flag and you do the dump out into the real world, there is lore you can find that references the exact same companies that take place in the um, in the Watchdog series, right? Like it's it's they're the same game, they're the same fucking game. They're merging it all into one just fucking shared universe. So like, ugh, it's just. Ugh. Um. Yeah, Wither. Yeah. Also, Watch Dogs One, cool, gritty, kind of fun, right? Watch Dogs Two. All right, I get it. You're targeting a fucking like younger demographic, and you're going for like the youth dollar and shit like that, right? All right, I can tolerate it. I can tolerate it. Watch Dogs Three. I'm sorry. What happened to my protagonist? Oh no, but we have we have an innovative system where everybody, it's a collective. Yeah, that's that's great. For organizing something in real life, that's an amazing methodology. For playing a video game and telling a story, it's a shit idea. Talk about a cursed fucking URL there. Jesus Christ. All right, here's the URL. <laughs> that's that's what that URL should have looked like. <laughs> uh, DoorDash pays $5 million to settle San Francisco worker miscla uh, misclassification probe. Let me guess, they probably owe, like, fucking way more than that, but they they settled for five. Um, dude, I, I, dude, I loved Watch Dogs 1 with her. I loved Watch Dogs 1. Um, I, I, I love Watch Dogs 1. Dude, Aiden Pierce was a great protagonist, even though he was doing it for all the wrong reasons. He was sort of an anti-hero. I, I enjoyed the fuck out of that, right? Marcus, he was tolerable for Watch Dogs 2. I liked some of the surrounding characters far greater than the protagonist himself. Um, but... Um, there we go. Um, three... Three's a three's a swing and a miss. Three's a swing and a miss. Um, she got here, cupcake.
Hmm. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, that's the PP host doing more of the typical all right stuff. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw. I saw. Dude, I mean, look, we can't give credence to what that person is saying, right? Like, Cupcake, you, you Cupcake, you feel me on this one. That video that idiot and then idiot number two posted, or idiot number one posted and then idiot number two retweeted, right? That video is emblematic of a greater cultural problem, though. There is issue there. Like, there's there's something to be talked about, but we can't talk about it because either you get hit with, on the left, some, like, woke scoldy shit, or you get hit with, like, some ethno-nationalist shit on the right, right? You're like, can we just have a reasoned, nuanced discussion about this topic? Because there is underlying tensions and issues that need resolving, but can't talk about it because either side's going to lose their shit if you talk about this topic. We, from an, from an alien lies, we just got done fucking reading, like doing a reading of theory that was like, I don't know, an hour, hour and 20 minutes long. Like we just wrapped up actual theory discussion. Right, like, look, I can't, I can't help you with f fucking timing, but it's a collective work uh, that anarchists wrote to take the piss out of right libertarians and ancaps, or so-called anarcho-capitalists. It's, it's a dissection of uh, right libertarian, uh, Austrian economic, and so-called anarcho-capitalist theorems. Uh, cupcake, I hear you. Yes. Okay. Good. Like, I'm glad you fucking, like, there's a thing there, but we can't talk about it. Uh, oh, look, somebody identifying as a, Pol a Bolshevik saying somebody should be thrown into a salt mine. Who would have guessed? It was a conjoined effort of fuck you. Um, it was. Um, and if you want the text, I can get you a copy of the text. But yeah, um, yeah, it was, it was definitely, uh, uh -huh. um, Nazbol socialist racist fucking grand. Yeah. Basically at this point, um, oh, um, one, one last thing. Hoppe, um, justified removing all left wingers, homosexuals, altruists, fucking altruists, right? Environmentalists from ANCAP society by forced, uh, by force. If you look up the hoppy and snake, H O P P E A N, um, snake, the, it's a far right meme. This is, this is partial inspiration for the hoppy and snake memes. So like, uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, right? A fucking German born, German trained, Austi Austrian e school of economics fucking douchebag that lives in my fucking town, right? Left wingers, homosexuals, altruists, and environmentalists should be removed from an ANCAP society by force along the, longs, along the lines of um, Pinochet. Like, he literally sort of, you could see the, the, the Pinochet inspired. Um, rhetoric as well. Yeah. Hoppa. Uh, why altruist? Um, because capitalists should do things for their own good, for their own motivation, for their own, for profit, for profit, for profit. And if you're doing it for altruistic reasons, that could undermine the capitalist modality of operation. So they, they are a problematic element in society and should be removed by force, according to Hoppe. Yeah. Hoppe, when your brain isn't rotten enough, says Swede. Ah. Uh. Look, I don't name names. I agreed I won't name any names on stream. But yeah, that, that person is a Hoppian. Okay? Like, that's, that's he self-describes as a Hoppian. 
okay? Remember, fucking Rothbard is foundational. Rothbard believes in race science, does not believe in empiricism, believes in natural law, right? Believes that you can turn a kid into slavery, right? Roth, uh, turn, just sell a kid into slavery, right? Rothbard is foundational, right? They build off of this, right? Von Mises and, uh, uh, and Hayek are anti-empiricist, right? So, okay, so here are the like economic foundations. Science bad, okay? Then comes along the theorist and spins in ethnostate and racial science and yeah, sure, we can sell kids into slavery. Then comes along fucking Hoppe and tosses in, yeah, you know what? We should probably purge all the left-wingers, the homosexuals, the altruists, and the environmentalists from our society as well. By the way, fascism is kind of cool and ethnostates are fucking based. You're describing yourself as one of these people? Right? Like, he, he goes around and describes himself as these people. Right? Like, they, oh, I'm a, you know, I'm a hobbyist. Okay. Right? Like all the all the worst ideas seem to be friends. Who goes who just goes and while we're at it, fuck charities. Like who birthed you? Uh <laughs> Swede, Hoppa when your brain isn't rotten enough. That was a quote from one of my professors. Jesus Christ. Um I, I just just so you know, just so you know what you're dealing with when you deal with fucking AMCAPs, right? They are ethnostatists. They are slavery promoters. They are anti-science, right? They are irrational. They use a priori reasoning in place of empirical uh, uh, empirical evidence. It's they're super fucking problematic. And here's you want to you want an example of how problematic they can be. If you're an American and I say libertarian, you know what I mean already. They stole the word. They stole the word. They stole the word. Okay? This is the kind of shit that I talk about when the gay gay fucking camp. Like, we will take your word. They took libertarian. Libertarian used to mean something else entirely. If you go to fucking Spain or Britain or France or Germany and say libertarian, right? Libertal. Right, like it means something else entirely. On this continent, they stole the word. If we say libertarian, we immediately think of these fucking right wing tech bro chud idiots, right? Like that's who we're thinking of. They want the word anarchist. They want the word anarchist. They're coming for it next. That's I'm literally holding the gates on this one. This is I am quite literally doing the fucking Gandalf shit on this. Like, you shall not pass. Right? Like, that's what they're coming for next. They want the word anarchist. It was. It was, uh, Caboose, it was basically the soft version of anarchist. When you wanted to say anarchist without being like, anarchist. Yeah. No, I intend not to. Um, I intend to fight them tooth and nail to the very death. Right, like I, I will, I will not go quietly into the good night. Like I, I'm going to take this one to my grave. This is a fight I will fight my entire life. Yeah, they are not, they are not anarchists. There is no portion of them that are anarchists. They're not even libertarians. But we will concede and call them right libertarians, just to like North American or American libertarianism or right libertarianism, just to make the distinguishing feature. But in no way, shape, or form will I ever refer to these people as anarchists. Cupcake Caboose, can I get a Photoshop of Kai on You Shall Not Pass? Boom. Hans Hermann Hoppe. Oh, and Hoppe is H-O-P-P-E. So you know. Wither, an anarchist. <laughs> That's, yeah, a left libertarian is an, anarch is an anarchist. They were synonymous once upon a time. Yeah, 
That's literally what it is. They stole the word. Hoppe is a footnote in textbooks on how not to be an economist. Sweet, sweet. I want to discuss Hoppe for a second. Can you get on the air? Wither, because language sucks, man. Um, fucking, and if you're running a fucking bingo card, deploying Swede, do that. Feel free. Um, run it. Okay. So, anarcho communism didn't, uh, oh, fall to imperial. Oh, Jesus Christ. I'm not getting into history. I, I'm focused here. I'm focused. Um, he is the professor emeritus of economics at UNLV. I'm not kidding. Like, I'm not kidding you. Like he's, he's here in town. Like he is literally the professor of, uh, uh, emeritus of economics at UNLV right now. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> what does that say about UNLV, man? <laughs> well, you're in Nevada, which is you're either, uh, an anarchist or you're a right wing nut job. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, that's Nevada for you. Yeah, like right, like dude, we're we're a fucking AnCap's wet dream, aren't we? <laughs> Fuck it. Paradise, unincorporated paradise, Nevada. Yeah. So, uh, the 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 worldwide center of debauchery, um, which is weird because fascists usually are uh, totally against degeneracy. Or what they would call degeneracy. Well, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure Hoppe fucking has more times than not had some like offhanded comments about Vegas or some shit, right? Like, yeah, I'm sure. You know, but it's impossible to, um, it's impossible to get in with him. Like, you can't get a fucking interview with the guy. So, like, he won't talk to anybody. <laughs> like, that's, um, but yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's literally the professor of emeritus of, uh, of economics, um, in UNLV. I, mean, I went to a freshwater school and everyone, everyone I know hates, hates him. So, uh, and, and that's from a freshwater school perspective. Um, so, so everybody, um, so everybody knows what is the difference between freshwater and saltwater economics. So freshwater is your inland chicago it's the chicago school basically um that's your uh friedman-esque would be a good way to say it milton friedman-esque um he's probably the most pragmatic of the ones to use within the freshwater and then john maynard Keynes would be your saltwater your east coast your west coast harvard duke uh berkeley along those lines yeah it would princeton be yeah yale um, but, uh, yeah, but, you know, uh, Kellogg and Booth would be your, your freshwater schools, Creighton, Xavier. It did uh, generally around the, the Great Lakes, right? Like that's usually around, yeah, around yeah. that area. Uh, I believe, I don't remember the name of Minnesota's business school, but it's pretty freshwater too. Yeah. Zippy. That's, that's literally, that. that's, it is, it, there's a difference in like, um, the the like fucking what what do I, what do I want to call it? macroeconomic research something along those lines right like there's a distinction yeah, a, view, a view of of uh, the view of the role of government within monetary policy but it, there yeah but it it is it is most assuredly like certain schools are teaching it certain ways and the certain ones that are teaching it a certain way all seem to be sort of clustered and congregated in certain areas in and around certain water bodies of water. So yeah, it, it, colloquially it became known as fresh water or sweet water. I've heard sweet water as well over the years, but fresh, fresh water and salt water economics. So who taught you your, what school of economics you came from? Yep. It, it allows you to basically place your bias on the table while also throwing your, your phallus on the table as to where you went to school. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the salt waters tend to be a little more vocal about it. 
They tend to be yeah. Berkeley, Princeton, Yale, Harvard, Columbia, right? Like they, they'll they'll definitely let you know where they went. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and what's interesting enough, though, is that Stanford is would probably be classified as a freshwater school. Stanford on the campus unless <laughs> is very left until you step into the business building. Oh well, I mean, it's not. That's that's kind and of it. Kind of has to be being in Palo Alto with the tech boom. I was going to say, isn't that kind of par for the course, though? <laughs> like you know, oh, it's a very yeah. sort of very liberal left leaning a left leaning campus. Welcome to the business school. <laughs> Forget all that shit. <laughs> um, well, you know, and that's the thing would be uh, if you went to Harvard Business School. I mean, Larry Summers is the president there. Uh, who is the architect who designed the entire 2008 collapse of the United States economy. Um, let's see, the guy at, uh, oh, what's Penn's, I forget the name of the Penn School, um, Wharton. Oh, yeah, Wharton uh, School of Business. Wharton, uh, advi- has, a, has an advisory or had an advisory position inside the government while sitting on three corporate boards. So sitting there advising on economic and fiscal policy while sitting on three very large corporate boards, because that's not a conflict of interest or anything. I've never taken a business ethics class. Is it as much of a joke as we make it out to be? Um, I want to say more so. Cool. Cool. Um, I mean, one of the big things, if you go back to some of the biggest movers and shakers of what, of who caused 2008, you know, um, they're all sitting on corporate boards while advising the government on fiscal policy and macro policy. And it's, it's, and they don't even have to report those as conflicts of interest. Jesus Christ. Based on the uh, educational um, and government worker uh, statutes of, of ethics. However, if I were to turn on in my business, the ability to make money on Twitch by playing a computer game, I would have to file that report that get permission from my employer and FINRA just to be able to make an extra $50 a month from playing seven days to die on Twitch. Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, I, I, I do. You're the it's, president it's a of a business joke. school and you get, which, it's a fucking you know, joke, man. you're president of the business school. Of course, you're going to get invited down, you know, to Washington DC to, an, yeah, to of advise. Course. Of course. I mean, power consolidates, power consolidates. This isn't complicated yeah. fucking. Oh, you're in charge of like foundational constructs being taught to the next generation of business people and economists in this nation. Can I, can I talk to you for a minute? <clears throat> just, mm-hmm. just want to have you over for dinner. Oh, you're also sitting on the boards of five different major corporate entities. Mm. Eh, that's not a big deal. What a coincidence either way. I'm um, sure wait, that won't come up at all. It's, it is just exactly how it works. Um, who is Wharton's president? No, that's still not on center. Um, <clears throat> that's rarely ever on center. So, yeah, no, it's it's a unicorn. Um, you noticed like the system. See, you think you think anarchism is like turning your back on everybody. Anarchism isn't that, right? Like we just don't believe in authoritarian centralizing power structures that well, the USSR, Mao, or the US or Britain or Germany or France use because we see how those inherent are inherently flawed. Right? Like that's that's the truth of the matter. It, for an anarchist system to be corrupted, you have to corrupt basically all of the people. 
for a centralized authoritarian system to be corrupted, you need to corrupt like one dude. That's easy. That's fucking easy. Power alone. Lord Acton rule, right? Power. Power tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? Like Lord Acton rule alone is going to dictate that system fails, right? And you can you can choose Lenin. You could choose fucking Mao. You could use fucking doesn't really fu- matter whose system you choose. You could use the U.S. system. You could use Britain. It does not matter. Centralizing authoritarian systems are very easy to manipulate and corrupt doesn't matter if they're capitalistic or communistic, right? Um, Because nobody's actually achieved the communistic dream because everybody's tried to do it through a centralizing authoritarian state structure, which is really interesting. It's like trying to beat someone healthy. It's like, I'm I'm, I'm, going to heal you with my magic wellness stick, right? Like, I'm going to fix state by using a brutal state regime. Right. Like it's 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 sort of an ass backwards idea. If you want to get to communism, you can do it. You just got to do it through anarchism. That's all. Do you do the one joke? Percussive medicine. Beastical? Yes. Percussive medicine. Um If God is all-knowing and all-powerful, then is he all-corrupted? Yes. Yeah. Fucking kids get cancer and shit, right? Like, fuck God. If God exists, fuck him. Yeah, he's a horrible, horrible, horrible thing if if God exists. As Stephen Fry said, if I'm wrong and I have to stand in front of him, the first words out of my mouth would be, how dare you? Yeah. I, I would I would definitely not have the uh, the the uh, composure of Stephen Fry in that instance, right? Like I've I've exper- I experienced my fair amount of progressive degenerative suffering, right? I I got I got stronger words for God than "How dare you?" Fuck you, you piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> you owe me at this point, right? Like I created you. Yeah, why'd you do that too? By the way, shit move. Did you have my consent? Like, Jesus Christ. And let's talk about that creation, by the way. Talk about shoddy work. This is, this is third and fourth rate workmanship. Like, this is, this is cheap Chinese, like, factory slave labor workmanship here. What the fuck? You're all powerful and all knowing and this is the design you came up with? This is shit workmanship. So what'd you do? Phone it in that weekend? He's like, eh, good enough. So God's lazy too? God's God's just half-assing it? All powerful, all knowing, but kind of lazy. Doesn't really give a shit. Cool. That's a great recipe. Yeah, stupid fucking idea. <clears throat> My wife has instructions that if I die anytime soon, that uh, if anybody are, is to say uh, I'm in a better place to promptly punch them. Good. Yeah, Satan, Satan definitely would have done a better job. 100%. Satan definitely would have done a better job. God is a petty-ass biatch. <laughs> well, it pretty much says as much in the Bible. It says he's a jealous person. Yep. In the, in the Bible, it pretty much describes him as... Uh, as as the uh, what is it the overattached girlfriend? Um, I love I love the book of Judas. Judas better spin to the Bible. Um, yeah, I fucking what what what? I'm just looking at some of the chat. Um. Jude is actually the oldest book based on the language used in the manuscripts that we have. The language itself says that it is the oldest book of the Bible. Which puts it closer to the iteration, therefore potentially more reliable. Um, And it also puts that Satan is a member of the heavenly host. I'm, I am all for 
fucking the original rebel. Hey, nonsense. Uh, just some stuff and some other stuff and some other stuff. Um, wait, I'm being tagged in memes. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That's kind of cursed as shit, man. All right, Caboose. Whether Yahweh is actually the uh, product of uh, the Bedouin people migrating north uh, and inserting their warrior god into the Canaanite pantheon. Hey, Gemma. That is the ugliest thing I've ever seen. It's brutal. <laughs> it. It's brutal. <laughs> It's fucking brutal. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Caboose, fair enough. Thank you. Hey, thanks for going to the extra effort, Caboose. <laughs> oh, that's fucking rough. Oh, that's rough. Well, I guess I get to see what I would look like as a, like an old hairy, like old long bearded man because I'm not going to get to experience that in real life. So, yeah. I have a fun story from last week about a bunch of capitalists being lectured. Um, By whom? Marsha I Ivins, mm. who was uh, an astronaut. Okay. So she's giving her talk about the history of space flight and everything. And guess, guess what one of the questions from a capitalist is, uh, you know, how has the privatization of space travel affected? Yeah. Uh, the, the industry and, and everything. And she basically went on a half hour tirade Good that insulted her. every, every person in the room as thinking that the private industry uh, had basically saying that they all need to butt out of space travel. Good and for the her. reason is, is she goes, you guys view the return on capital within say years she goes you guys think way too small you're too small-minded you guys are too puny you need to think in decades and centuries yeah none of you have the capacity to think long term enough for this industry you all need to get out yeah you could hear a pin drop it was great <laughs> oh based marsha ivins um fucking yeah I agree. I, I uh, her other complaint agree. was is that uh, the the um, the administration has too much control to change the direction of NASA. Uh, in that every four to eight years, yeah, they get the retasked. Can be canned, canceled, whatever, because people want to put their name on whatever, um, not realizing that Kennedy's name is all over Apollo Eleven, and he wasn't even alive to see it. Yep. And just get, just fucking give them the money and get the fuck out of the way. <laughs> um, if you, her, her comment essentially was, is if you look at, at the timeline of the investment within NASA itself, what Apollo 11 did is still giving us returns on that invested capital. We are still reaping the returns on that. The f but the fact of the matter is, is we didn't see that until probably three or four years after 19, the 1972 landing, the final landing. After that is when we started to see all the, you know, earth technology, earthbound technology kind of catch up to everything. Start utilizing it. Yeah. Um, no, that's, I, I love that. Fuck it. She absolutely took the piss out of a, a room full of probably venture she, capitalists she told and shit. a whole bunch of billionaires you guys are too pea brained yeah yeah you guys are too <laughs> small minded to understand this concept i love it love it fucking somebody needs to tell these assholes that on a regular basis you're myopic you're small minded you lack vision it's like i'm a billionaire i see the big picture you don't see the you don't see anything beyond your own fucking bank account number like that's, that's the distance that you can see. And it's like, you know, oh, I'm planning for, you know, a hundred years in the future. No, you're planning on how to continue your legacy and profiting a hundred years into the future. Not a hundred years into the future. You're myopic as fuck. I, honestly, good, good honor. Um, it, was, it, was, it was quite the show. Yeah. 
Uh, she, her her other comment was Elon Musk alone has probably held back space travel by a decade because he <laughs> does his taking away of NASA running the transportation systems up and back mm -hmm. uh, essentially stopped everything at the 1965 technology that we use today. Lovely. Because he has to make a profit on what he does. So he's not going to develop cutting edge stuff. the development stuff. of a new technology yeah. based on what the government is providing him, keep in mind, most of the money he gets for space travel, is... SpaceX is 75% government funding. Yep. He's one of the biggest uh, welfare recipients in the country. He is a welfare queen. Yeah. Uh, she called him as much. Did she really? Yep. Add a girl. <laughs> Yep. She went through the statistics of each one of his businesses and how much it relies on government subsidy. Oh, it's not even socialism, unicorn. It's socialized costs, but there's a vast chasm of difference between socialism and socializing. Um, yeah. Corporate welfare, you know. Corporate welfare, yeah, is probably the best way to go for it. Um, but yeah, I love that. What was you, were you at, where was, where was this? Were you in attendance? What was it? Yeah, I was in attendance. It was a, it was a conference of hedge fund managers and people like me, uh, at the Fairmont in San Francisco. Ah, yes. I heard you were going out there. Um, so that's what you were in attendance for, or just one of yeah. the lectures that was given. It was, uh, everything was a general session. So we were all there for everything. Most of it was, you know, people like from BlackRock getting up and pontificating about where the private equity space is going, blah, blah, blah. Boring but, for you guys. Not but they people. they occasionally bring in the outside speaker who's tangentially related to yeah. the topic. Yeah, and but, they usually yeah, have a hot take or three. One one of the one of the speakers was somebody who uh, whose entire like hobby is financial history. And he uh, financial amnesia is, I think that's what his little thing was called. Um, anyway, he, he basically goes through all the crashes, you know, from 1400 clear to today. And he's what like, was, you know, what was his name? Uh, his company name is financial amnesia. I believe that's his Twitter. Let me look it up here real quick. Jamie Catherwood. Thank you. Investor Amnesia is his Twitter handle. Anyway, he basically uh, uh, pontificates that uh, investor behavior hasn't changed and the, the cycle of innovation to imitation to idiot uh, rules the day in every situation. So when somebody comes out and innovates and makes a hundred to one return, everyone imitates, they all get one and a half to two times returns. And then the idiots come in and the idiots are not the investors. The idiots are the people that try to do what the imitators did, but are so bad at it. They end up scamming everybody out of their money. All the investors at that point. Look at, look at that young thing in his Brooks brothers suit. He's adorable. <laughs> Very eloquent speaker. Um, very good at what he does. Uh, I love, then, I love uh, Marsha I, Ivern, Ivans. I, I love I keep say Ivans, but Ivans um, I was love, the second day speaker. I love this fucking. We're just fucking putting random shit in the chat. And it's just gold reserve. <laughs> um. Yeah, learning about the tulip mania was wild. I like them too, but goddamn. No, um, <laughs> investors are not the most brilliant people usually. America owns China, owns China trillions? Free market? I, I, again, this, this is sort of China has largest. Do you mean gold reserve? <laughs> China has largest what? <laughs> Uh, you, you can, Ooh, can, penis. I but. mean, can we can we get a complete sentence? Um, 
and they're not even close to us. Like, I mean, Germany's the second largest usually. Um, America's gold reserve is huge. Like, that's they're not allegedly, allegedly yes, allegedly, allegedly. <laughs> uh, but it hasn't it, been what audited since it, the seventies. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a hot minute. Yeah, it's been like a half a century since we audited it. Um, so. <laughs> Both fucking Karina and Caboose went for Fort Knox, baby. <laughs> and, you know, America is not paying for Chinese infrastructure. China is taking out debt to pay for their infrastructure, and their debt per capita is enormous. They are on their own debt bubble. The entire Chinese economy will collapse at some point soon. And by soon, I mean a few decades. Um. Would I trust the audit results? Depends who does the audit. I mean, you know, if Donald Trump did the audit, no, I'm good. Actually, you know what? I would probably trust a Donald Trump audit. Right? As long as he had somebody else counting, right? Like, I, I would trust Donald Trump to be able to spot gold. He's got, an, uh, he's got a hard on for gold. So if he went in there and there wasn't enough gold in his opinion he'd probably bitch about it. But somebody else needs to handle the numbers because let's face it, he's not really a hard facts kind of guy. Um, yeah, I think if he went in there and the gold were missing, he'd be pissed. So we'd probably find out about it, quite frankly. Um, but no, it's, it's, it just depends on who did the audit as to whether I trust it or not. Uh, tomato, if his startling revelation was forgotten, well, how did you type it in? No, everybody still knew that. It was just, it wasn't top of mind on September 11th as the events were unfolding. Yeah. Within a week, people were back talking about the, the missing money. There. It didn't take long for that to come back up. And one, I think one of the crusaders that kept made it stay in the front of the mind was Bernie Sanders. Um, would be, yeah. Thank you for the waste of time, Chow. You didn't even spell Chow right. I mean, C A O I. I believe. <laughs> C I A O. Okay. I knew it was yeah, some it's, combination it's... of those letters. <laughs> C I A O. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, yeah, there's, there's like literally like all sorts of articles dated from 2001 fucking about the, the 2.3 trillion, like just go looking like there's, yeah, there's, Red, there's Reddit posts and fucking news articles and videos and like Yahoo finance articles. Um, Yeah, the the ten person commission on nine eleven actually did a pretty good job. That report, if you read through it, it's it's a hell of a it's a hell of a report. Ciao, ciao. Um, fucking what is it? Is it that? Um, oh, it's it's um, Izzard. That's who I'm hearing. Oh. I'm I enjoy the tomato copy pasta like conspiracy shit though. Okay. Um so that fun one one um is a big fan of like infrared, Chud Logic, Lauren Southern Live, uh fucking <clears throat> Wait, infrared and Lauren Southern? Oh, and also Ancap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, when trying to figure out what the fuck they're on about, good luck with that. That's all I have to say. Um, <laughs> shit. <laughs> yeah, uh, Arias, um, the military stealing and wasting money is hardly unknown. It's just that no one seems to care. I mean, some people... Some someone, I mean, some people care, but you know, yeah, definitely not a fucking critical mass. 
I mean, that two point three trillion was over how many years, though? I I still. It was probably over like 30, 40 years. And if you like parse that out over, you know, the budget, it's probably like 10% of the budget. Um, <clears throat> Cause I think 2.3 trillion was the actual like government budget at that point in time. Um, who did you main in Mortal Kombat slash Street Fighter? I wasn't a Street Fighter player, um, but for Mortal Kombat 3, um, like uh, Mortal Kombat 3 Ultimate, I would have been in the sort of, um, I, I, dude, I, I played the shit out of smoke. I played the shit out of smoke. Um, <laughs> there was a couple in there that I'd probably play. Like I was fairly heavy into the like robot ones. Um, Sector, Cyrax, Smoke, um, fucking Ermac. Um, but yeah. So there you go. There's your answer, Karina. I didn't, I didn't fucking really do Street Fighter. My cat just looked at my leg while tilting his head, looked away, then looked back at my leg. He isn't very subtle about what it, when he's going to attack me. Crim said, I mean, you know. Uh, I don't think English is their first language. They focus a lot on China. What's the time in Beijing? What time is it in Beijing? In Beijing? It's two in the afternoon, Tech. It's 2.14 p.m. in the afternoon in Beijing, China right now. Um, did we, did we lose our other one too? That's, that's the, um, I haven't seen the other one in a while too. Either way. Um, yeah. Did you have something to say about inflation, Swede? Like you were, you sure. were doing that shit earlier. That graph on the, uh, which one? First one or second one? Yeah. Either one. It's fine. All right. It's on the screen. Uh, it's on the screen. All right. So you see the blue and the red line. The red line is uh, personal consumption expenditures of durable goods. Uh, the blue line is services. Services is going to the movies, going to the restaurant, going out, you know, things that aren't actually like going to the furniture store and taking something home, whereas the red line is. Okay. Now... After that, that gray shaded area is the pandemic recession. Okay. When shit hit the fan. So as you can see, and this is year over year change from the previous year in billions. Uh, so what you're seeing is, is that services became passe because nobody could go out to eat. Nobody could yeah. basically live their life as they had. However, almost... Oh, gee, a month after the recession ended and the pandemic, um, people started buying goods because when you have to work from home, you have to buy a desk, you have to buy a computer, you have to buy maybe a new TV, you yeah. have to buy the webcam, you have to this, that, and the other thing all the way down the line. As, as we learned last year from the uh, chip crisis that all of a sudden, all this demand, everybody wanted to upgrade their computer or everybody wanted to get a new one. Uh, all the chips were just hard to find. Even, you know, the new Ryzen chips for a while, you just couldn't find them. Uh, at this point, you're looking at a year over year positive in goods. So if you're looking at this, this means demand is higher than the previous year in goods, but in services, it's you know eight hundred billion dollars below uh, the previous year, four hundred somewhere in there, five hundred. Uh, so the whole like thing switched, but goods nobody expected this, and people weren't at work, and we have a supply chain constraint, so people are literally spending a little bit more than they did the previous year, but you have a massive supply chain disruption. So which means that the supply of what's available to buy with those expenditure dollars is less, more dollars chasing less product means what? Prices sure. go up. Yeah, prices up and shortages across the board. 
And so, and we saw that toilet paper was, you know, the funny example that we're, that you're in my generation will always remember. Jesus Christ. Uh, remember the time when you couldn't buy, sh- you know, wipe your butt paper. We're, we're, we're going to talk about that the way our parents talked about the uh, Jimmy Carter gas crisis, aren't we? <laughs> like Pretty that. Much. Yeah. That's going to be our Jimmy Carter gas crisis for our generations. <laughs> it's just fucking like, remember the toilet paper? <laughs> anyway. Uh, and, and well, people in England are going to talk about the gas crisis that's going on right now. <laughs> How's that Brexit working for y'all? <laughs> oh, fucking idiots. So what, what we're looking at here is what's called, we, there, there's two sides. There's Larry Summers, who is saying inflation's here to stay. Uh, and then there's people like me, Claudia Sam, uh, Jerome Powell, uh, Lale, and a few others that are like, no, this is team transitory. This is just once the supply constraints come back to normal or, or alleviate back to a normal level, we'll be able to supply the goods and, and we'll get back to normal. And as we see, as the pandemic has, has lessened, the services, the demand for services has skyrocketed year over year. So as those goods come back down to a more um, stable year over year number, um, we'll start to see inflation come back. Now, when people say last month reported 6% inflation, that is an annualized number. You have to divide that by 12. Um, Wobble, sweet, already explained that. Dude, I'm fucking having a weird deja vu for a second. Somebody asking clarification on a graph that sweet is explaining. This has happened before. This exact moment has happened before. I'm having weird deja vu involve involving it. The black bar is the, the core of the pandemic depression, economic depression. Yeah. The, the gray part is where GDP was negative. That, which is a recession. Oh, recession. Gray bars, there you go. gray bars on Fred charts are recessions. What does Fred stand for? The Federal Reserve. Is where is the ED? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, where's what's the ED come from then? Federal Reserve Economics Department, probably. I'm guessing. Okay. Anyway. Anyway, but yeah, all this information comes out of the St. Louis Fed, as you can see on the bottom right. Anyway. So the big point here is, is that we have economic, economic data, federal reserve, economic data. Yeah. Uh, it's been, it's been a long week. Uh, and it's only Monday and let's, so the big point that to take away here is that we had a huge uptick in demand for goods with supply constraints. Once the supply can, constraints return back to normal, uh, we, we will probably see inflation return back to normal. And then also when people say inflation is at a number, that's an annualized number. And not to think that last month had a, had a real 6% uh, bump in prices. No, it was a half a percent. Um, across the board. So why is you that want to argue why about is, how inflation is calculated? That's fine, but why is that um, why is that expressed that way? Why is a metric that's done like on a monthly basis annualized in its display? Because everything gets annualized so that you can always compare annualized numbers against each other. Okay. So that you're not comparing a monthly number to a quarterly number when you're comparing. Say, so like it is just months. standard economics practice to annualize yeah. numbers. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so our, some, some measures are only done on a quarterly basis. And if you have one that's done on a monthly basis and you want to do a comparison, you just annualize the numbers. Okay. All right. Yeah. I was like, well, then why the fuck do they do that? All right, cool. Well, thank you for that answer as well. Um, so basically what you're saying is, is that things are actually returning to somewhat normal stability levels for supply chain and all of that bullshit, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Eventually we will. Uh, the other big one that you'll see is, you know, the, the, what, what they call the, the great leaving of the workforce or the great retirement or the great resignation. And it really should be called the great retirement. We've seen 3.2 million retirements from the workforce over and above what was expected. And the current worker shortage is roughly, or the current 
uh, reduction in the labor pool has been about three and a half million. So you could probably explain 70 to 80 percent of the worker shortage based on a bunch of 63, 64 year olds going. Fuck it, I'm out of here. OK. Hey, Viva. And that's a lot of people that you have to replace by workers that are, you know, you promote workers up into those roles. Well, then you have to replace the, the, the people under that into the new roles. And guess where all those people are coming from? The service industry. Because Deep breath, unicorn. Deep breath. Every, every right-wing person said, well, if you don't like what you're getting paid, get another job. And so they did. Well, now when those right-wing people go to a restaurant and can't get service, they, yeah. now you hear them saying, no, not like that. Yeah, they did. <laughs> um, they went and got another job. <laughs> I, Dude, I revel in those stories. Um, fucking one dude the other day, was talking to him on Reddit. He um, straight up, like he was in, where was he? Burlington Coat Factory. He was interviewing Burlington Coat Factory. And the fucking manager was a douche right out of the, the, the gate. Like he was, he was sort of like slumped back in his chair waiting for, like he was doing the like computer training portion of it. And he's sort of like leaning back in his chair and she comes in and fucking immediately starts. Are you dead? Are you okay? Are you dead? Are you dead? Are you dead? He's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? It's like, well, you should be sitting up straight in your chair. Oh, Jesus Christ. Like right out of the gate, she starts being an absolute just twat about everything. And he got up in the middle of it and just like, I quit. Like, I'm done. I'm not, I'm not hiring on here. She, what? You can't do that? He's like, yeah, I can. Catch you later. Like, like I'm out of here. This is shit. Like, I'm not putting up with you as a manager. Like, you've already shown me this place is shit to work at before I'm even through the like introduction computer training bullshit. Come out. Peace out, bitch. Like, so for the first time in the American workforce history, we are seeing labor. what it's like for uh, micro economies to actually have expressions where people can actually do the, if I don't like it here, I can just quit. Because in most places like Stockton, California, or a lot of you know towns like that, where people either a don't own reliable transportation or depend upon uh, mass transit. And, and so they're reliant upon where mass transit goes for their workplace. Uh, for a long time, they've been like, well, I'm limited to either this route, this bus route, or I'm limited to say a 10 mile radius where I know my car can get back and forth to, uh, then that that's my pool. Nowadays, within those ranges, there's a lot more people hiring. So all of a sudden we have this actual like competitive workplace where, where companies are actually having to compete with each other. And we're seeing wages due for the first time uh, in a long time. In my lifetime. First, in my the first lifetime. Time since 1941, yeah. we're seeing the, the very first time wages are spiking harder for the bottom quartile than it has for any other quartile. Yeah. This is the first time labor's ever been in a position of leverage, like in mm -hmm. most of our lives, like maybe crusty dad fucking, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a thing like this is, this is legitimately, if we can keep this, all right, look, this is, this is dark. This is dark. I'm warning you ahead of time. This is dark. Right. But I used to talk about this before COVID, right? Roll back the old episodes. Right. And I would talk about the um, reforming of economic systems and some of the contributing factors in um, feudalist Europe as to the collapse of feudalism and the ushering in of constitutional monarchism and a different, a, a differing wage, uh, a, a creation of a new wage sector, shall we call it. One of the fundamental components of that, the contributing factors was the black plague. It's the black death that wiped out a chunk of the labor pool. And a third. yeah, <laughs> a, th a third, um, of the labor pool. And all of a sudden, the lord on the manor didn't have the workers they needed to work the land so that they could survive on top of it. And now the laborers start going, well, 
yeah, but the guy down the road is hard up for it too. And he's offering me actual ownership of some of the land. He's offering me tools to start. He's offering me X, Y, and Z. What are you offering me? Offering of payment was you get to keep 10% of everything you harvest or whatever percent. Oh. And people are like, oh, so I'm going to own part of the product of my labor, like own it. Yeah. And all of a sudden it's like, well, I'm going to him. What you got right now? You've got a, now you've got a buyer's market sort of situation, right? They're competing, right? Like I'm going down to him and leaving your field to dry out and die. If you don't hook me up, what you got? So that is. And the only thing kind of what happened back in that point in time was information flow. They didn't know what the Lord of the Manor three doors down was going to offer because word just didn't travel far. Enough. But if it did, shit collapsed. Now it does. Uh, yeah, and suddenly Burger King found a way to pay 15 bucks an hour. They always could. Don't ever let those asshole fuckers, I swear to God. Um, yeah, and so what we're having is a couple of stacked iterations, like Swede pointed out. The boomers are retiring in mass, and we had a, fu- a disruptive element to our society coronavirus covid right um so you stack covid on top of the boomers retiring and you start to see the same effect only now as we pointed out we have informa- information sharing we know when others are going on strike we know when somebody's getting screwed we know when somebody's got uh, won their fair wages we know when somebody successfully unionizes. We know when somebody's unionization attempt has been undermined by private security forces. Looking at you, Amazon, you fucking Pinkerton assholes. Right? Like, it's like that. Um, so if we can keep this ball rolling, if we can move this forward, like if we can keep the momentum on this, this is the first time in our lives that the actual window of opportunity of change is opening. And it's going to be long enough because the boomers haven't even reached their peak retirement period. That's still yet to come. So the amount of boomers retiring will st- is, it will continue to grow. Uh, and it, that number will remain elevated until I believe my sister's generation. So in the mid 70s, the birth rate got really low. So we'll see like a really a drop in retirements. Uh, when so when what uh, year? It's like 2040, 2030, yeah. 20. Okay, so something like late 2030s, 2040. But we're going to see more people entering retirement than, and you, and you're going to see actual advertisements like you are today of fast food places reaching out to the retired community, saying you want a job that pays you. 15, 16 bucks an hour while you're retired. I mean, you you don't need to be retired anymore or you can work part time. Do you you want to be a scab? Hey, 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 old people, you want to be a scab? Fucking pieces of shit. They'll cross that picket line. You better believe the boomers will cross that picket line. Some of them will do it just to spite us. Mark my fucking words. That's going to be a cultural uh, thing for the fucking boomers. We start kicking off general strikes and shit. Retired boomers will make a point of pride to go work in some of those shops. Fucking assholes. But, but the, the fa- the also the fact of the matter is a lot of these boomers haven't saved up enough money, so they're going to have to anyway. Social Security isn't enough to pay for the living expenses because we've got a population boom that's happening at the moment because of record levels of immigration and we just don't have the amount of supply necessary to meet the demand on new housing and the constraints of bad zoning laws of shit Mm. community and regional planning of aging infrastructure and a society that's based on individualistic transportation systems uh, is going to end up killing the bottom half of the the population because they're not going to be able to keep up if things don't change. I mean, you're making like large declarative statements, um, unicorn. Um, 
I mean, the National Fast Food Workers Union was already a thing, right? Like, by saying, like, the fast food workers just unionized. The fast food workers have technically been unionized for quite some time. Um, So I don't know exactly which iteration of it, whether you're talking about, like, a specific burger chain unionizing. As for general strike, as you said, that we're in a general strike now... (sighs) There is no hard and fast formula for whether what constitutes a general strike. It's generally referred to as a substantial portion of the uh, pro- a substantial proportion of the population uh, engaging in a uh, a labor force movement, right? So the current total population labor force is about 160 million. Okay. So that's the amount of people that either want to or have a job. How many are on strike? Can we find that number? How many people are a member of a union? 14.3 million. Not even 10% of our entire workforce is a member of a union. Therefore, the ability to strike as one in an organized fashion on a labor force level is, is doesn't even approach 10%. Yeah. That's, that's, that's my only, like, I agree, Unicorn, that, like, the tonality of society is shifting, and I agree that a lot of people are refusing to go back to work, and I'm on board, like, I get it, it's just, there's there's an element of pedantry here going on that it just is, I'm unable to move past, that's all. Um, Unicorn, the, the vast majority of those refusing to go back to work are doing it through retirement. Uh, misallocation of housing factors is uh, in two. Airbnb and rental units are becoming more of a thing out of formerly owned homes. That is true. That, that's true, but it's not as much as you'd think. Um, just just like Blackstone buying up a whole bunch of quote unquote single family homes or whatever, and I shouldn't say quote unquote, they are buying them, those types of things up, but they're doing it at, at such a small pace as compared to the general like uh, market itself that. In micro economies, it's a problem. Like certain communities will be affected by it, and we should care about that. But on a national level, it's just not enough to affect uh, nationwide policy. I, how I'm just thinking for myself, like how, um, yeah, unicorn. I, I look fucking. Can we get all of them? Right? Well, can we just, just, unicorn, just shut it the fuck down for five days. Just five days. Honestly, the capitalists would freak the fuck out. The oligarchs of this society would freak the fuck out. Right? If society managed to organize itself, collectivize itself to the point where we could just shut it down for five days and then turn it back on to demonstrate that we, we're, we're working together as a single, single unified unit. And we are in charge. We just turn it off and turn it on, turn it off and turn it on at our will, right? Until you bend to our will, they would lose their fucking minds, right? Like if we could get a proper societal, like uh, what was the walkout the plebs did in Rome? Um, that was like, if we could get, um, uh, was it, yeah, 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 the Aventine Secession, that's what it was, the Aventine Secession, the, the, the trib- uh, Tribune of the Plebs, right, when, when the, the plebeian masses literally just walked out of the cities, run it yourselves, we'll, we'll be out in the countryside, have, catch y'all later. So, the, the general strike needs some actual true organization to it, because as Unicorn yeah. notes, uh, you have to do it in such a way where there's no planes in the air when it happens. Yeah, oh yeah, no, there's all sorts of shit you have to organize for it to happen. There's dude, there's here's here's my okay, the so here's running, there's no trains well, running. But here's here's my idea for a general strike and always have spent. It's it's inspired by the fucking Japanese bus drivers and other people do this as well. But I, I learned the technique from the Japanese bus drivers. Just keep society running, just stop the flow of money. That's what they care about. Just so keep they stop charging people to get on the bus. Yeah, they the bus the Japanese bus drivers when they go on strike continue to drive their routes. They just refuse to take money for it. Yeah, 
Go to your work as a cashier at a fucking store. Go to a retail clerk. Fucking go to a go to a fucking like, you know, Target or Walmart or whatever and fucking beep beep beep. How much does that cost? Nothing. Beep. How much does that cost? Nothing. Let them know how much inventory they lost. Let them know how much gas was pumped out of the gas pumps. Let them know how much society produced, but don't move a single fucking cent. You're costing them money actively, and yet society continues to run. Because imagine the number, the imagine the halting of the financial industry if there's no traders on the floor. Right, like it, it's <laughs> there's ways to kneecap this shit and keep society functioning. <laughs> Just think of think of the the crush of the bond market freezing. I don't even know what that would like do. Would that even affect anything outside of their weird little math problem that they are running? Uh, when, it, when you actually need money to start back up. Uh, yeah. Cause all the short term funding for all businesses to make payroll is done through that. Okay. Um, Rev because the majority, like, because a good chunk of, uh, of adults don't actually work. Sure. Uh, yeah. They're retired. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, that's, that's always been my, my suggestion for a general strike is keep it running, keep it running. Don't shut it down. Just shut down the element that is powering this bullshit. It's all about money, right? It's all about cash. It's all about the dollar dollar bills. Y'all right. All right. Shut that shit down. Let them know exactly how much they lost on even a day. I think a day where like a day without money, all right. Like that movie, was it a day without Mexicans? It's a good fucking movie, by the way. Um, a day without money. Right. Where Dwayne had a day without Mexicans where all the Hispanics walked off the job. Yeah. Oh yeah. That shit fucking shut shit down real quick. <laughs> the entire restaurant industry in Des Moines was done for a day. Um, oh, Zippy. That's where, um, direct action comes into play. All I'm saying is, look, look, again, I would never encourage anyone to do anything illegal or destructive, especially that of someone else's property. But if those credit card machines and those self-checkout machines that the boomers would use in your example, Zippy, were non-functional on the day that somebody attempted to do this, all I'm saying is that they would have but little choice to participate. Just, just, just technical, technical hiccups happen, you know, with those sorts of computerized systems. So who knows? Maybe that day they just don't work. Um, but good traffic cone in the self checkout. You're right, tech support. That alone would do it. Just a fucking traffic cone in the self checkout. They'd fucking. They just nope. Ah. Uh, the VIP rope. Yeah. They just, they wouldn't, they wouldn't cross it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's dude. When I learned about how the Japanese bus, uh, bus drivers strike, I, <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Karina. Um, I, it was, it was a, it was a light bulb moment. I'm like, that's how you strike. Right. Like, cause I've talked about general strikes in society and you know, the, the issues of medication and food supply and like this system is expansive and the just in time systems that require, right. Like there are mechanisms and means by which we could strike and keep things moving. Um, it would require a certain element of go fuck yourself to management because I assure you, there will be many, many, many middlemen and middle women and middle NBs and however you may fucking identify middle managers the country over who are just lick the boot heels of this bullshit, right? That would attempt to fucking put the kibosh on this. They would. They try and stop it. But. If you're clever enough, if you're crafty enough, if you're determined enough, you just work around them. Big deal. So, yeah, I, 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 I firmly believe that we could organize a general strike technically. 
the issue with the general strike comes down to solidarity. For me, I've never... I've never been in a community over a certain size that understands the concept of solidarity properly, right? Like I've been in like micro communities, right? It's, we're talking micro macro here. We're talking us versus the country, right? Like we could get some shit done. We can be, we can, you know, have some solidarity. We understand each other. We'll stand with each other. I get that. But getting Karen in Paducah, Kentucky to understand the plight of someone in, uh, you know, uh, from a black family in Stockton, California, right, is that has always been a bit of a hurdle for our society, for our culture. And because we are so hyper-individualistically oriented, again, I've talked about this before, circles of empathy, empathetic response, decreases in empathetic response rate, the more, an emp- uh, more a society is individualized versus communalized, right? Like our, our actual structure of our society drives down the empathetic response of the people in, uh, involved in it. So, you know, that's my issue. My issue is I don't think, a, I, technically, I don't think a general strike is difficult, difficult to accomplish in this country. I think with all of the, the brilliant minds we have, with all the logicians that we have, right, we could, we could figure that out, no problem. We could figure it out. Um, some people, maybe you just don't engage in the general strike because we deem those like necessary systems and we're going to keep them running on that day, whatever. I do not believe for a second that the technicalities of a general strike are the hang up for us accomplishing a general strike in this country. I, I firmly believe with my entire brain and all of my heart, you know, that it, it's an issue of the social fabric. It's an issue of culture. It's an issue of empathetic response to our fellow humans. That's always been my issue. United States culture with empathy is pretty shit considering we didn't show empathy to people that were literally owned and beaten into working. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, it just depends how you use evil there. Um, Empathy sounds like commie shit. It is. It is. It's fucking commie shit. Fucking get that out of here. Goddamn fucking better dead than red. Fucking. I don't know how the generation that was yelling better dead than red and fucking Wolverines f- uh, immediately like started stanning Putin. That was the weirdest turnaround I've seen in my life. Uh, what's funny to me is like I the the, the I think I've understood the 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 basic why they hate CRT and like my parents generation doesn't want my kid like my parents don't want my kids their grandkids to learn that they were standing they were, behind yeah. the the black girl uh-huh. at school screaming at her to not that this is a white school they don't yeah yeah no that's 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 been a thing um hang on let me yeah here um there you go yeah the reason they don't want crt to be taught is because this was like swede and i this was our parents okay the people in these photos that's like our parents generation Yep, just a tad bit older than my parents. Yeah, like that's that's really uncomfortably close. Like that's that's the thing. That's why they don't fucking want to talk about this. Is because this was them. This was this is these were their peers. These were the older kids they looked up to. Right, like this is this is this is uncomfortably close to home for them. This is the things that my parents and other people like them supported either actively or passively. Here's here's Sweden eyes like grandparents, right? Like see the dude on the left, the white dude in the fucking cop uniform. 
that's like our granddad. That's his generation, right? Like that's that's yeah. their generation of fucking. This is like our granddad. That's the World War II soldier came home, became a cop. Yeah, and then this. And what's funny is is, uh, and I've heard this, and I wish I could find the the actual article on it, but uh, soldiers that serve together between racial lines. So like the bomber pilots that were protected by the red tails actually became, were, were way more likely to become civil rights activists. Oh yeah. Imagine that personal experience contributing to changes in changes in your like uh, social perceptions of a group. Huh? Who would have guessed that works? Um, or like the, the mechanics that worked on the, on the fighters, you know, a lot of them were black uh, or the assistance to the mechanics. Well, those mechanics went home and went, you know, the, those people aren't all that bad. Uh, I don't know what you guys are talking about. Yeah. It's, um, it's almost like we see time and again with fucking social conservatives. Fuck these queers. These goddamn faggots are ruining our society. Um, dad, 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 I need to have a talk with you. What yeah. son? I'm gay. That's okay. I love you for who you are. Everybody fucking, he is born this way. He is my son and I love him no matter what. Like that. On a fucking dime they switch. Yeah, Dick Cheney. Pisses me off every time I see it happen. Pisses Dick me Cheney. off every time I see it happen. Yep, Dick Cheney's a classic example of fucking, these goddamn queers should know their place. Uh, Dad, I'm a lesbian. Hey, you know what? Fucking everybody's born and fucking they are who they are and we Equal should all be rights. treated as equals and individuals in this society. It's like, oh, fuck you, you hypocritical piece of shit. Um, but... That is how it works. That is how society changes. I mean, that's as, as irritating as it is to see in the moment, as Swede pointed out. Like, yeah, people from World War II that, like, served with black servicemen came home going, I don't know what y'all are on about. What, what, what's the fucking deal? Like, they're people like you and me. Calm down. I fixed my airplane. Yeah, he <laughs> saved my fucking life, right? <laughs> he made sure I didn't fall out of the sky, right? He treated me with honor and respect the whole way through. Like, fuck you for telling me that he's somehow less than you, right? Like, yeah, oh, yeah. Like, personal experience like that changes minds. Changes minds. This is why this is, this is the only way that it ever seems to shift. I integration. Oh. I, mean, that's, I I want to see a study about kids that for forced integration schools about how their opinions changed over time about racial lines. I want to see I want to see what forced busing did, not as far as part as educational quality, but as the changing of the opinion of the white students. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jesus Christ, so many people. So many fucking people. <laughs> so many people. Fucking Gemma. Fucking, for the record, that story is me echoing my mom's words and terminology. Unicorn, me quoting my parents' racist bullshit, big to be us back at them. Fucking, just fucking Karina. Fucking <laughs> Cupcake. Fucking, yeah, just so many people. Um, it's it's not complicated. It really isn't complicated. I, Buddhist, I'll throw in my parents too. Yeah, dude. Um, I luckily my mom never like she was never like anti anything. Like my mom is so not that person, right? Like honestly, my mom's one of the good ones. She's a look. I'll be honest. She's a bit of a cunt. <laughs> my mom, my mom can be a bitch. My mom can be a bitch. <laughs> um, she's, she's very exacting. She's, she's, she's that type of personality, right? She's very exacting. Um, and if you don't live up to the expectations or standards, well, she's going to let you know about it. Um, but outside of those sorts of personality traits, 
she doesn't, she would, she would never judge you. She will judge you on your performance. Good night, Akka. Uh, nurses are, yes, nurses are that type of personality, right? She will, she will judge you on your performance, not on who you are. She does not care how you identify, who you are, who you sleep with, how you sleep with, where you Unless sleep you're with. you're a doctor, then she just automatically thinks you're a piece of shit. Yeah, yes, that is true. She hates doctors. Um, but she's a nurse. All nurses hate doctors. That's just the way, like, somebody has to keep the patient alive. Somebody has to have contempt for the doctor <laughs> in order to make sure the whole system doesn't grind to a, ha- uh, uh, a halt. But uh, she is. She is pure mer- and meritocratic. Um, she, all she gives a shit about is who you show her, right? Like, how, how do you interact with her? That's all she's ever given a shit about in my entire life. I've never seen her care one shit about whether someone is homeless, whether someone is formally educated, whether somebody is not educated, whether somebody is of any racial or ethnic group, sexuality, gender, honestly, like I'm super grateful for that because that's, that was formative for me, I'm sure. Right. Like I I just show me who you are and then I'll judge you. Right. Like I don't hate you because you're black or gay or lesbian or trans. I hate you because you're an asshole. Right. Like that's, that's, that's where my disdain for somebody comes from is like, yeah, yeah, they're kind of a fucking asshole. (laughs) Fuck them. But yeah, that my stepdad on the other hand is a piece of shit. <laughs> my stepdad, on the other hand, is a bit of a piece of shit. Um, Texas. Oh yeah, unicorn Texas. It's a bitch. Um, even in places where it shouldn't be, it is. <laughs> Okay, so your mom, someone who is perpetually five minutes late but is super correct and productive versus someone always on time but fucks up uh, a couple of times a week, who would she prefer? She'd prefer the person who was late but uh, correct and productive. My mom would just, uh, uh, she would just build into the schedule the five minutes. If you're reliably five minutes late, my mom will just schedule things five minutes shifted. She'd notice that pattern like that. And be like, yeah, well, whatever. The rest of their work is fine. Who gives a shit? She'd, she'd accommodate that in a heartbeat. Um, hey, you're Even awesome. Austin outside of a few neighborhoods is terrible. Mm, interesting, Karina. Texas. Austin is a tech community, and the tech community is very right-wing. Uh-huh. Tech bros. Fucking tech bros. There's dude, so many tech. If you bros. want to know where and caps reside, reside, it's tech bros. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Fucking right wing libertarianism and capism dude. Tech bros. hundred percent tech bros. Uh, my mom has never hit a blunt. Um, <laughs> my mom has never smoked weed. Um, She's had, she has had a sip of alcohol once in her life. She had a sip of champagne on my stepfather and hers wedding night because he insisted she did not like it. Um, she does not understand it. Um, so yeah, you also have to know, um, my, my grandfather, um, the the psychotic genius that he was was also an alcoholic. Um, he, he he for a moment in time during some formative years of my mom, um, tried to dummy it down. Right, he was trying to pour alcohol on the brain. Right, this is a dude that knew like I forget twelve or seventeen languages. I forget. It's he's in the teens in the amount of languages he knew. He taught himself a bunch of them, up to and including Hebrew and Navajo. All right, this is not a dumb man. Uh, mechanical and computer engineering. Um, also uh, a very good writer and a musical savant. Pick up an instrument and play it. Territory. The guy was legitimately a genius of epic proportion. Um, and he, for a time was trying to just shut his brain up, right? Like you can imagine what that's like, what, what that kind of brain is doing to you constantly. He just, he was like, I need a fucking break. And so he became an alcoholic. 
Um, and my I hate the way that Jordan, that Jordan Peterson is right in this, but as a psychologist, he's not completely stupid, but it's people use drugs to be, to reduce their consciousness. Depends on the drug, but I agree. Well, due to the, the escape version yeah. of drug use is to, is to either shut it eliminate up. or, or reduce your consciousness. Yeah. It's to shut that shit up. Um, and so, yeah, he was pouring alcohol on it for a time to shut that up. And my grandmother, um, straight up told him it's the booze or us take your pick. And to his credit, he picked and he picked the family. He never touched another drop of alcohol in his life. Um, he went cold Turkey and he, he held the straight and narrow for good. That's dangerous. Yeah. Well, he did it. Um, I, you know, credit where credit's due. The man was a Marvel. He really was a Marvel. Um, and you know, but that left my mom with some very imprinted positions, perspectives, because she was a little girl when daddy was an alcoholic. That went on for a few years before grandma made the call and said, knock this shit the fuck off. Right. So she got to witness a few years of her formative like development as a young child looking up to her father who becomes a you know role model, a, 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 an imprint for male figures in her life. Right. Like she saw an alcoholic up close and personal. And so my mom has always been very twitchy about those who show tendencies towards substance abuse. She's actually really, um, she's really liberal and open-minded for those that can prove that they're not dependent. If you can show my mom you don't need it, she doesn't give two shits what you do. The minute that she sees that it is a dependency, she's going to get a little twitchy. She's going to have some flashbacks to her childhood and it's, it's going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, Pantheravis, I did too, 11 years sober. Good on you, Pantheravis. Fucking good on you. Mad, mad props, 11 years. I used to be a can a day chewer and four years ago, I cold turkey quit one day, just done. Nice. Crystal, yes. That, that was hard. Um, <laughs> yeah, my mom's never been a fan of caffeine. Um, so she doesn't, it's, it's not as bad as the other stuff, but yeah, yeah, it definitely is in that camp. My mom's like, why do you need it? Um, a can a day. Holy shit, man. That's a lot of fucking chew. Yep. Um, There was, there was rarely a time there wasn't one in my mouth. Oof. That's disgusting. By the way, that's, that's one of the most disgusting habits that you could have. Is, yep. is fucking chew. And I used Ugh. it to quit a two pack a day habit. Holy shit, man. You had a bit of a nicotine fix, huh? Yeah, it was uh, how I, how I worked on my anxiety before I learned that you could actually like go to therapy. That is. Uh, Karina, neither. Neither. Your mom's fix is soda or candies, ain't it? No. No, it's apple butter. It is. It's apple <laughs> butter. Honestly, it kind of is. You should have seen her light up. Um, she fucking, she was, she's happy with that. But she also, like, you know, knows how to reward herself. So, yeah, she, she will, like, if you put the thing that she's looking forward to in front of her, she will have some, and then she will save the rest for a later date. <clears throat> it was actually pretty easy. I would say it, it was easier for me because I had two young kids and I was basically doing it for them to quit the, to quit the chewing. That is easier. Yeah. They, that gives you at least a fucking, a, like a real biological switch in your brain cause to fucking do it. Yeah. And, and 
I mean, like my wife's rule always was, is like, you can chew in your office, but nowhere else in the house. So what you do is if you want to chew, you just leave the office. Oof. And you can't do it. All right. Um, Pantheravis, that's fucking rough on the teeth, man. Um, Crimson. Yeah. If you've got, if you've got addiction issues, especially like hereditary addiction issues, if you've got addiction, like on both sides of the family sort of territory, dude, don't fuck around. Don't fuck around. It's not a good thing. It's not a pleasant thing to deal with. Um, I'm just super, I'm super fucking lucky. Right? Like it's not, this is far from the first time I've mentioned, I don't, I don't fuck I don't addict. It's, it's weird, but like I've done the heavy stuff. I've done the stuff that should create an addiction, right? But it doesn't, it doesn't hook me for some reason. Um, it's, it's weird. Um, there's of course a physical normalization, right? We could call this dependence, but like my mental, the will state over it is, absolute um it's it's simple for me to stop something it's yeah like i i did ecstasy for years like i've look i've told this story right i i I hooked a supply line basically between california and my school in arizona back in the day because i fucking i wanted to do ecstasy so i fucking created a supply line basically between Alley in my school and I did ecstasy fairly regularly for a number of years. Right. Um, I did meth as a gay fucking, you know, a twink in Las Vegas for a number of years. Both of these, I literally stopped cold on a day where I was just like, Oh, you know what? The downside is where it is, uh, the, the, the cost is greater than the benefit. Right. The, the instant my brain goes, Oh, you know what? The cost is more than the benefit on this now. I just stop and I never look back. It's not an issue. Like I can just not, um, it's, it's weird that way. Um, but that is how my brain works. It doesn't seem to be subject to those sorts of things. Um, and I'm super fucking grateful for that. Um, my fam have super addictive personalities, but I do not get addicted to things at all. Fucking lucky, lucky, lucked out on that one, sassy cat slaps. Fucking sassy, good on you. That's, that's fucking, yeah. Uh, same, I still crave that though, nine years later. I would, the only thing I miss is the debauchery of like, you know, like a meth-fueled three-day sex fest, right? Like that's, dude, that's a different level. But am I like craving it? No. In no way, shape, or form do I crave it. But I've said before, if I were, if I wake up tomorrow and I'm 18 and I'm healthy again, the first thing I'm doing is doing that. <laughs> right? That's that's a good time. Um, but you just don't do it forever. There's nothing sadder than some 45 year old or 50 year old gay dude doing tweak and trying to fucking like party and play on the weekend. It's just sad. It's sad. <clears throat> um. Studies with rats on addiction were redone when the rats had a healthy social life and the rats didn't have a problem. Maybe that's it. Um, I, I, you know, yeah, you had, um, I had a problem with acid back in the day. Lefty, um, I've done an inordinate amount of mushrooms in my life, like an inordinate amount. Um, but yeah. Oh, fucking unicorn. You and me both. You and me both, trust me, with a progressive neurological condition, believe me, I feel you on that one. Uh, <laughs> oh, let's see. All right. Um, All right, it's one o'clock. Sleep well, old man. Oh, en- enjoy your metronome. <laughs> oh, all right. Have a good one night, everybody. Hey, sweet. Uh, my only addictions have been psychologically, mainly food, because uh, mainly because of some shit my parents did around using food as a reward. Yippee. Um, never got hooked on nicotine, never got hooked on booze to the point of cravings. Caffeine is a vice I can live without. My addiction is power, honestly. Um,
mine is experience. Mine is experience. I wish... I firmly wish I could download the experiences. I would love to I would love to experience your experiences. I would love you to experience my experiences, good, bad and indifferent. Um That would be that's my thing. Yeah, that's my thing. How do you how do you go through life and not experience the thing, right? Jumping out of a plane, clinging to a rock face, breaking your consciousness from your bodily bounds. Right? Like I just yeah. Um cupcake. Yeah. Uh, I've had some uh bring on the hive mind. Um Oh, I want to do, I, I never got the opportunity to do halos. Unicorn, you want to do a halo. Uh, high altitude, high opening jump. Um, an orbital halo. You, you want, you, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, exactly, Gemma, exactly. Um, Buddhist, what, what addiction? Just out of curiosity, if you don't mind sharing it is it's not a cheap hobby it's not a cheap hobby by all means um yeah probably one of is one of my more expensive hobbies that i've had um karina food and then just try and not end up in my head again this this body is betraying me in ways that i wasn't prepared for and now I'm just trying not to think about it. Uh, the best I can do right now for myself, Karina, is get my physical state back into play so that I have a release outside of what I've been using as my release because that may not be on the table very much longer. Um, so I need to be able to get back... Um, I need to be able to get back on a climbing wall I need to be able to be get, get back. Like, I need to be able to do some sort of extreme sport physical activity. Um, so I need to figure out what this body can endure in that arena. Um, because it's failing. Um, so to answer your question specifically, I will probably try and get a couple of workouts in. Um, I've been doing art. I took the last couple of days off on my arms um, because my shoulders were irritated. So I did an abbreviated core workout before stream. So I may extend the core workout um, and um, do some arms, some legs, and maybe some cardio on top of all of that. Um, and then food and then try not to be in my head. So whatever that entails, it may entail video gaming, it may entail a bath, it may entail both. I don't fucking know. But basically my job is at this point to like try and piece this body. The neurological system's fucked, right? But the, the musculature and the, the ligature, the musculature and the uh, skeletal, I have to rehab. Um, Pantheravis, I am way beyond tumor turmeric at this point. Oh, blob. 100%. 100%. I like listening to audiobooks while playing video games. Um... Uh, thank you, Zippy. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, so. Uh, oh, God, I need to order more hemp protein, too.
Um, There we go. Um, yeah, what time is it? Yeah, oh, yeah, then it's time. Um, hundred percent. Cause I need to get my ass in gear then. That's already, oh. Oh, and I may end up doing some CBD THC. <sighs> um, yeah, Zippy, if I game, I'll stream on Discord. Um. Yeah, exactly, Gemma. Fucking Borg me right the fuck up. Um, 100%. I'm on board with that. Rip out this fucking nervous system and give me a, an electronic one. Don't give Ricky a follow. Great, great. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Um, maybe I'll do seven days to die. Maybe I'll do, um, uh, Forza. We'll see. We'll see what I play. Um, but if I play, I'll be on, uh, I'll be on voice chat on discord. So those of you that are on the discord server, um, either way, we're going to raid over to Ricky. Um, like I said, I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get a, I gotta get a few workouts in, but I may be on voice chat for some of the workouts as well. Um, au revoir. Uh, so if you want to hang out, let me know. I may, uh, I may use discord to just like try and keep me refocused. Um, either way, thanks for hanging out. I mean, if you're, if you made it here, like to here from the surf's raid, Props to you. Um, either way, let's go say hi to Ricky. And yeah, tomorrow's Tuesday. Tomorrow's um, late show. So tech support, sleep well. Catch you later, man. <laughs> later, y'all.